Good morning. Welcome back on Monday, day three of the course. <sighs> Hopefully everybody's up and awake. Mondays are hard. If you have not already done so, please let me know in the chat that you are here. And I'll check you off. Okay, so day three, before we get into today's content, I will open it up for questions from what we covered yesterday. So um, you guys were working on dichotomous keys. You were working on creating or reading phylogenetic trees. Uh, we talked about just the basic organization structure from the top down. This idea of domains, three very large, broad groups. Eubacteria, Archaea, and Eukarya. And then we talked about the kingdoms that fit underneath those, the next level of specificity, a little bit more specific than general domains. Eubacteria has bacteria in it, Archaea has Archaea in it, and Eukaryotes or Eukaryota has protists, fungi, animals, and plants. Any questions from any of that stuff? I did have some people that came to um, the meet on Friday, which was great. Great time to get your questions resolved. Really quickly, did I go over the um, diversity unit vocabulary list? I, ca I can't remember whether I did that or not. I feel like I did. I feel like I have a memory of reviewing what you do in the vocabulary list, but I'm not 100% sure. I did. Okay. So uh, I, I know that I didn't go through the species spotlight assignment in any detail. You will get an entire block at the end of the unit to work on it. Um, so today's day three, so it would be Tuesday, Wednesday would be the day um, where you'll get a block to work on um, the Species Spotlight assignment. But just so that you have sort of the idea in the back of your head of what you're going to do, I'm very quickly going to go through the assignment and just discuss what you do in the Species Spotlight assignment. Um, so you have some idea of like, where we're going with this, like where what you had what you had to put together at the end of this. Um, oh, and a question: What is a choice statement referring to on page thirty-three? Oh. Um, so if you look at LF, if you look at table one on that same page, um, that's, that's a different type of dichotomous key. Um, instead of being a visual dichotomous key that like has the choices as like physical decisions that you can like see, you have to like follow a pathway basically on the page. That's a visual dichotomous key. Um, this this one is like a choice dichotomous key. There's another name for it. I can't remember what the thing's called. Um, but that that table one represents a different style of dichotomous key. It's where they're at each decision, which we would normally have had like a like a sideways V, right? Like a decision in your tree. Um, you could also write them as a choice statement, and a choice statement is just saying either you choose the first one or the second one. That's the same thing as the dichotomy represented by the V. In the dichotomy, it's, are you gonna go this way? Yes, or are you gonna go this way? No. And, and a choice statement works exactly the same. So like, for example, the first choice statement is body, 
with flat dorsal and ventral surf surfaces or body not noticeably flattened. So flattened versus not flattened, that's the choice. So asking you to go one way or the other is a choice statement. That's what it's referring to. So it says, how might biologists benefit from using a dichotomous key with more detailed choice statements? So choice statements that instead of having very general features on them are things like contains three hairs under its chin or contains five hairs under its chin or something like that. The, it'd be like a more specific, more detailed choices as opposed to broad, um, broader choices. Oh, that's my train of thought. Oh yes, right. The species spotlight assignment. So first of all, I don't want people to get confused. You're going to be creating a Google Slides presentation. So it mentions that right on here. I have a sort of exemplar at the bottom, but it's not in the form of a Google Slides presentation. Um, maybe uh, if uh, there's one that comes out particularly well at the end here. I'll, I'll ask you if I can borrow yours to use as an exemplar. But right now I don't have them as a um, Google Slides presentation. I have this as like a rough outline. We used to do it as a poster. So you're going to have a title slide that has the name of your species. I did this as humans. You can't pick a vertebrate. Okay, so remember in the back of your head when you're choosing a species, it cannot have a backbone. But You've got the name of your presentation and then the name of your species, common and scientific. Okay, both formats of the name. You're gonna have a slide that explains all the taxonomical levels for your species. So what's its domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Uh, and then uh, you'll have a third column. There's no way for me to write on here, is there? The third column will go right where it says include an explanation column here. You'll have a third column that explains why your species fits into each of those categories. So for example, if it's a eukarya, why? What makes it a eukarya? If it's an animal, what makes it an animal? Why is it an animal? This is that, that's what goes in the third column. So you're going to explain why it has been um, placed into these categories at every taxonomical level. And you can look this stuff up. So for example, mammalia, look up what a mammal is. And then what part of your, your organism like makes it a mammal. And then you just, you just let me know that. Okay. So you're going to do that for whatever species you choose. You're going to show me a life cycle. The actual image of the life cycle itself does not have to be made by you. Uh, you can find a life cycle. You're probably not going to be able to find a life cycle for your specific species, but you should be able to find a life cycle for your kind of species. So for example, like you might not be able to find one for, you know, the specific starfish, the blue ocean starfish or whatever it is, but you will be able to find one for a starfish. Uh, and so you take a general one and then you're going to number them number the steps I didn't do it on here but you're gonna number the steps the the type the parts of the life cycle and then you're going to add with each number and you can do it off the side or underneath or on the next slide uh, again you, again there's no maximum to the number of slides so you can have stuff go over multiple slides if you if you wish um, but you're going to describe each step of the life cycle what's happening at each step is it sexually reproducing tell me about its reproductive cycle how long does each part of this cycle take? Is there like an infant form of your organism or like an infantile form? Is there an adult form? How long are the adults before they're sexually mature? Um, how long does a reproductive cycle take? How long do they live? You know, all of these things. Does it specifically have to be an insect of sorts? No, Brie, you can do anything you want. Anything that does not have a backbone there's many many things that don't have backbones you can you can uh, you can go protist you could even do bacteria or archaea if you want uh it could be anything just anything that doesn't have a backbone what so maybe as a better answer to your question what we're going to do over the next few days is we're going to investigate the different kingdoms of life and talk about them in a little bit more detail uh, you will find that 
the amount of diversity outside of vertebrates is extremely high. There's lots and lots of organisms that are not insects, but are invertebrates. There's many, 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 many types. So um, that, that might make it more, it might be more obvious once we, we go through that. We haven't done that yet. So, um, so maybe a lot of people are probably not aware of how much diversity is actually out there that's invertebrate, but there's a lot. So it does not have to be an animal. It can be a plant, fungus, take your pick. Okay, so you're going to discuss the life cycle. So that's part of it. You are going to show me a drawing. Now, I used to get students to draw this. This is a lot harder to do um, digitally. So don't worry about drawing it. Just just find a picture. Um, I, would, I would maybe cite where you got your picture. The last slide of this is going to be a work cited. So, so you should cite where you're getting your, your images from for this. Um, and that those citations just go on your last page. If you've never used uh, APA citation, hopefully you have, um, you will need to use APA for everything in this course and for every science course you ever take ever, including university and graduate school and, 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 and. Anytime you're in academia and science, you're gonna be using APA citation. Um, that it's preferred generally in the sciences. In, in English or in the arts, You've, you may have had to cite sources before, you probably have, uh, and you probably used MLA, which is very similar to APA, uh, but it is slightly different, and that tends to be the preferred method of citation for the arts. But sciences generally always use APA citation. If you're not sure how to use APA, um, did I include? Maybe I included a guide. Um, well, I left a link here for this Cite This For Me Chrome extension. That's a handy one. That, that's probably the easiest way to do it. If you if you install that Chrome extension and you find something that you want to cite, you basically just click the button and it makes an APA citation for you. Uh, it doesn't get too much easier than that. So uh, you could do that. You could also um, just Google APA citation and then you'll you can find a citation machine. They're called citation machines. There's even one called citationmachine.com. And you just input the information from the website that you're on into it and then press a button and then it will give you an APA citation. If if you're interested in actually looking into how to cite an APA on your own, like how to write everything out, what to italicize, you know, what to bold, where to use capitals and lowercase or whatever. Uh, there's an excellent guide on the library website, uh, which I can, it's, you can get to it from the KCI website. Uh, you could do that. I will be perfectly honest with you. I have been through multiple levels of academia. <laughs> I went to undergrad. I went to grad school. I went to teacher's college. We had, you had to cite stuff everywhere. I never learned how to use APA citation. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. But there are lots of tools that you can use to kind of shortcut it, um, which I use frequently. In in grad school, uh, you have you have to submit your own papers. Like instead, it, this is this is a little bit different from undergrad. You are actually submitting them to journals to have them published, publish your research that you've done. Uh, and I worked on a number of papers uh, that were submitted to journals. And th then you get into a little bit of a different territory because every journal, well, not every journal, but a lot of journals have their own citation style that they like in that journal, <laughs> which is really frustrating. But uh, at that point, you'll, you're, you'll, you're gonna use a, a tool, and then you don't need to know this in, in high school, you never, you never use this, but basically what it is is in the tool, you input all the information about the sources that you're going to use uh, and then you select from a list, a drop-down list, which journal you're submitting to. And then it will automatically format all of your in-text and after-text citations uh, for that particular journal, which is extremely handy. And, and every, everybody uses this in academia. Nobody goes through and does it manually anymore because if you're submitting to 10 journals, you're not going to go through and like redo your citations 10 times. So um, anyway, there are shortcuts and everybody uses them in academia. So you don't, I, I wouldn't trouble yourself too much with learning how to do APA. Some other science teachers would probably cringe at me saying that, but um, realistically, you don't really, <laughs> you don't really need to know. But anyway, you do need to use it though. It's, it's used everywhere. 
So I would recommend to cite, cite this form in Chrome extension. If you're getting information from somewhere and citing it, start by adding a citation on your last slide for this assignment. Later in the, in the course, in unit three, four, and five, you're going to be doing presentations in each of those units, and we're going to be doing the research for those presentations a little bit different, uh, differently. You're going to be creating a, a document where you actually track where you're getting your information from, uh, and then we're, we're going to um, put a little bit more focus on properly collecting research information in a way that prevents plagiarism and forces you to actually think about the information that you're getting from your sources. Uh, but I'm not going to worry about that at this point in the course. So at this point in the course, I just would, would like you to cite your sources, where you're getting information from, including pictures. Okay, so that would go um, on your last slide for this assignment. Well, I talked a lot about citation there, sorry. Um, if you are looking for information while you're doing your assignment on what is the kingdom phylum class order family genus species, um, you could use general Google inquiries to find that information. For example, Wikipedia generally has quite a bit of information on the taxonomical organization of a lot of species. However, when you look at those Wikipedia articles, they're often written by academics and academics that are specific to that field. So uh, someone who is a specialist in mushrooms, somebody who is a specialist in cetaceans, whatever. So what they tend to do in the Wikipedia articles is add a whole bunch of extra information that is confusing. And I mentioned this on the day that we talked about that st taxonomical structure when we talked about the ranks, that there are extra ranks that exist, subphylum, superfamily, things like that. And when you look this up on Wikipedia, oftentimes you'll see more of that and less of the standard structure, uh, which can be very confusing. What does it mean if it's in this super family? And it doesn't say what family, it just says super family. And then it's a, it's like, that makes a lot of sense if you are a scientist who's working in specifically in cetaceans or whatever, you know, you name the species, cervids or whatever. Those are deer, by the way, uh, whatever, whatever you're working on. But it's, it's quite confusing as an, a noob, <laughs> somebody who's just like, doesn't know that much about that particular type of organism. So there are two services that exist. Um, there are probably more than two, but these are the two that I, I used in university and that are uh, commonly used. One is called the Animal Diversity Web, and the other one is called the International Taxonomic Information System. Uh, and both of those are large repositories of taxonomy information. And you can usually search your species by common name. Although if you have the scientific name, that's helpful as well. Then you can narrow it down usually. And it gives you the full taxonomic structure for that particular species. Um, some of you may already have found these resources. Uh, the other day when you were asked to look up like how many species are there in this family or whatever, uh, the International Taxonomic Information System has that information in it. That's kind of the purpose of it. So, um, so you could potentially use that to figure out how many species were in a particular group. But anyway, uh, those two resources are great and they will help you figure out what the labels are for your particular species, how they are classified taxonomically. Okay, so uh, the last part of this is you need to create a dichotomous key. I realize that this is not a dichotomous key. This is just a bunch of lines, but I, I left it here to indicate the general structure of a dichotomous key, which is a series of choices. Uh, we made one the other day. You guys have used them now. Um, and you are going to create one with your species and five other species from the same genus. Now, ideally, they will be from the same genus as your species. Remember, genus is the level right before species. However, depending on the species that you pick, there may not be five in your genus, in which case you're going to have to go up a level to family. Or if there aren't five in your family, you may have to go up a level again and find five in your order. Okay, so depending on how many are in each grouping, you may have to go up a level to find enough. But you want closely related species. That's the point. 
You need to find pictures of each. So there's going to be six here at the end. Mine has five, which is a little bit annoying. I should have done six because there's five species plus your own that you've selected. Um, and you're going to create a dichotomous key to differentiate. Please use physical characteristics for your differentiation as much as possible. Okay, you need to show all of the species. You need to give their scientific names. Okay, if you want to put the pictures on a different page, you can do that as well. Some people found that easier to fit everything together last time, if I remember correctly. Um, and then just have the names at the end or something like that. That's also fine. But you do have to make the dichotomies based on what they physically look like. I, I get that. Um, it may be easier to say, oh, this one is, you know, I mean, when you're doing research on these, this one has a, you know, shorter mating season or this one has, you know, this characteristic. But the problem is I won't have time to research every single one of your species. Uh, so I have no way of confirming whether that information is accurate they're using for your table. If you're doing it based on physical characteristics like we did with the organisms in the textbook, uh, I can see that. I can test your key out. Uh, and, and that way I can you know see if it's properly completed. So if you could stick just to physical characteristics here, I realize that morphology, it does include behavior and normally that is fine, but just in our, in our particular circumstance here, don't include behavior. Uh, what else was I going to mention about this? Um, I think that's it. Okay. So you got a dichotomous key with five species plus yours. So that's six total. Okay. You've got a, it's supposed to be a drawing, but it's going to be an image, an image of your species. Um, and you're going to label some unique anatomical characteristics of your species. Um, generally, you want to, if you, if they have some type of survival advantage or an advantage that makes your, your species unique, um, you indicate that, but you may not be able to find that information for your particular species. So just name some physical features of your species that make it unique. Okay, this was easy to do for humans uh, because we're uh, different from other primates in that we have a very large cranium uh, and large body brain to body size ratio. So that's immediately apparent from looking at us compared to other primates. Uh, we have hands that feature opposable thumbs. Other primates have that as well, but it differentiates us from um, from other mammals. Uh, location of our reproductive organs, again, differentiates us from... Uh, not from other mammals, but from other animals, uh, and then etc. So you, you, so you can, if if you know of some, the importance of a particular physiological characteristic, you include it. But if if you don't, you don't. Are we going to have a list of who got what species? Nope. You're welcome to overlap. I don't mind if you two people are interested in uh, the blue ringed octopus. Let it rip. That's totally fine with me. I mean, obviously your presentations are going to look different. You're going to find different things. You're going to identify other physical characteristics. You're going to pick different features for your dichotomous key. Um, this information obviously will be the same, the taxonomical information, but how you describe the reasoning that it fits into each category will be different because you're going to be doing that work independently. So, so, so I'm not really that concerned if you decide to do the same species. Typically there's a bunch of overlap and that's fine. But don't pick a vertebrate, then you'll be fine. Certainly octopus, squid, those are all fine. Lots of animals are fine. Uh, you could do sea sponge if you want. But um, regarding uh, picking prokaryotes, though, that one last thing to note. Um, doing a dichotomous key for a prokaryote, remember those are bacteria and archaea, they're single-celled organisms. Uh, those do not have many differences uh, in terms of their physical structure. Uh, you could take five closely related, six closely related bacteria, uh, and they would look absolutely identical under the microscope. Uh, no, no physical differences whatsoever under the microscope. So in that case, if you do happen to choose a prokaryote, which, which you may, you're, you're allowed to choose anything, uh, you're making your life harder if you, if you do, but, but you're, <laughs> you are welcome to choose it if you want. I've never had a student do it, but you can. Um, keep in mind that when you do the physical characteristics at the end, you will have to go outside of obvious physical characteristics. You're going to have to talk about characteristics like uh, resistance to penicillin, um, what types of stains are going to stain the outer membrane, 
or the uh, cell wall of the bacteria, as in these ones will stain uh, with a gram stain and these ones will not stain with a gram stain or, you know, stuff like that. Okay, so just as a heads up, you're making your life quite a bit more difficult if you're going to choose bacteria or archaea here, but you can, you can if you want. Now, protists are cool. There's there's huge physical differences between protists. So um, I, I, I would say go for it with protists, but it, you might have a tough time if you pick prokaryotes. Anyway, so that's the basics of it. Like I said, I'm going to give you a whole block to work on that on the last day of the unit. Um, and there's a summary here of what you need to include in each section. It's not a, not meant to surprise you or anything. You should also, whenever you're doing an assignment, you may want to have a quick peek at the uh, rubric that I use to mark it. I do use the rubrics, and that's where I provide your feedback as well. Um, and so if you're looking for more specific information, look at the rubric. I, I will use that. But it, it, it's all based on what's here, what's, what's listed in terms of what you need to include. Okay. So, okay, we've gone over the project. That's good. You guys know what to do for the for the vocab list. Day three. As I mentioned, we are going to take some time now and discuss some kingdoms of life in more detail. At the very end of the unit, we're going to complete a summary table, which is what are the basic properties of each kingdom. I realize that you guys have did that at the end of last class. Uh, you created one of those summary tables. Well, the one that we're going to create at the end is a lot more in depth. And the eventual outcome of that is you should be able to look at pretty much any organism that's put in front of you and decide what it is. Is that thing a protist? Is that thing a bacteria? Is that thing a fungus? Whatever. Okay, so that's sort of where we're headed with this unit. You can identify sort of the general area of, of life for each one. Getting into too much more detail than that, picking out specific phylums in each kingdom, that's, that's the kind of thing that you're going to need a specific university course for. So I, I'm not going to dig too much into that. We'll mention some phylums. Uh, we're going to do a whole unit on plants, in which case we'll talk about the major plant phylums in that unit. But realistically, within most of these groups, we're, we, we can't get into too, too much detail. Um, we're going to be speaking in generalities for the most part uh, because there just is so much diversity out there. So if you're really interested in one of these particular groups, you're like, oh man, protists are cool. They are, by the way. Uh, then maybe you want to examine that more closely in a subsequent course, probably in university. But Because um, we don't get too, too much into this in the grade 12 course. The grade 12 course goes more the biochemistry route. So I'm going to go through, discuss bacteria and archaea together. Um, and viruses. So I'm going to go through and discuss those two things. Viruses are a little weird because they don't really fit in this course um, because they're not alive, and we're going to talk about why. Uh, but they are fascinating and particularly pertinent in our lives currently. <laughs> yeah, it's the reason why I'm at home. So um, anyway, we're going to talk about that. There's some videos that go along. I'll, I'll discuss what the videos are afterwards. Uh, after we get through the lesson component. Then in the second part uh, of today, after the break, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about protists who are, that are also very cool. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how far we get. We might, we might get a little bit behind. These are, these are pretty uh, complex topics. So um, we'll, we'll see how we do. Okay, so you guys completed this table last time using page 27. What we're going to do today, ideally, is we're going to talk in detail about these. Okay, so we're hitting, we're hitting three, three of six. That's a very uh, ambitious day. <laughs> we'll see how we do. Um, previously, obviously, when we did this course, I mean, doing these three groupings would probably take us a week or more. So we're, <laughs> I've cut a bunch of information off here. We're gonna, we're doing like the quick and dirty version of these things. So um, I mentioned at the beginning of, of most notes here, this goes for the entire course, I have sort of like a little main ideas section. Uh, I don't usually go through that with you, but that is left there as to help mostly with you for reviewing. So when you go back and you read about the main ideas, that's in intended to trigger your memories of discussing this stuff together. And if there's anything in there where you're like, I don't remember that, that doesn't even sound familiar, 
that is a good indicator that you should probably have a quick look over the note again, okay, or a specific spot, spot in the note. But those are summaries. Okay, so remember, um, we talked about this last time, this idea that what is a prokaryote? Well, it doesn't have a membrane-bound organelle, or organelles, rather. Okay, so they, uh, we're gonna, we'll talk about their structure in more detail, but they don't have a nucleus, they don't have uh, ER, Golgi apparatus, etc. They are very simple inside. And they make up an absolutely massive proportion of the living things on Earth by biomass, that is by like how much physical stuff there is, and also just by in diversity and the number of species. Uh, one thing that tends to confuse people, and these are, the, these are the two main groupings of prokaryotes, we mentioned this, they're domains and kingdoms, uh, is, so it's eubacteria and archaea. Bacteria, eubacteria are also commonly referred to as bacteria, so, I mean, obviously you've, you've heard of bacteria before, I'm assuming. Um, so <clears throat> eubacteria is often shortened, shortened just to bacteria. Um, these look structurally very similar, but they're actually on the genetic level uh, quite different, and they also have uh, structural characteristics that, are, that differentiate them. However, in general, the prokaryotes are very similar physiologically. So I'm going to mush them together into one grouping here. We're just going to discuss prokaryotes in general. I, I will talk a little bit about how bacteria and archaea are different, um, but just keep in mind that they, in many ways that they are similar and that they were considered one group uh, called Monera up until almost when I was in university, up until like the, the mid-90s, they were called Monera. So sometimes you'll hear a uh, an older biologist somebody in their 60s or whatever called them Monera. Uh, they were called that at one point, and then they were split up. So why do we care about these things? Well, uh, first of all, they're all single-celled. That's not why we care, but um, something to keep, to differentiate them from other small organisms. They're, uh, they are not complex enough to have multicellular colonies. Uh, because in order to have a multicellular organism, you have to have a ton of genetic information that is responsible for communicating between cells in a very organized fashion to keep all the cells essentially fun functioning together as a group. Bacteria and archaea do not have that. So they are far too simple to function as a single organism. Now, that being said, they do grow in colonies and they do communicate with each other via chemical messengers. Uh, I actually have a video that is an optional video for you to watch if you're interested on intercellular communication in uh, prokaryotes. It's called quorum sensing. They have the ability to know how many neighbors they have and it changes their behavior based on how big of a group they are in. So, which is it's really fascinating how it works and how why it's important in terms of human health, especially for pathogens. But, um, but they are single cell, so they they they're not multicellular organisms. They all are functioning individually. Okay, we already mentioned that they lack membrane-bound organelles. They are obviously the smallest organisms on Earth. They're all single cell. Um, in terms of size, let me see if I can find a quick size comparison here. Yeah, there's a good size comparison. Uh, actually, no, I want one with a red blood cell in it. There, that's even better. This one's good. Okay, so if you can imagine, there's your bacteria right there. That's an average size. Obviously, they're slightly larger and slightly smaller, but half a micron, that's bacterial size. Okay, um, that two and a half micron thing beside it right there is a piece of dust, uh, PM 2.5 particulate. PM just is particulate matter. Um, that is the, the size of particulate matter that most dust, dust masks filter out. Um, so oftentimes people will buy, you know, dust filter to like work in their garage or whatever. Or, or th those are usually PM 2.5 masks. So they're not small enough to block out most bacteria. 
if you if you want to do a size comparison to a virus when oh and the particles that are filtered by an m95 mask this is obviously i'm sure this is like some type of covid source here this is what it looks like uh they filter pm.007 that that's a that's a an m95 mask that's the size of particle that they filter um so I would say most cloth masks are not filtering particles anywhere near that small. Um, the fun the way that it filters out COVID, if you're talking about a cloth mask, is not necessarily from having sm holes that are smaller than coronavirus. Um, it has to do with layering the holes and then having um, basically the particles being caught up somewhere within the layering. Um, so that it's not... Um, it's not as straightforward as that, but an M95 mask actually filters out uh, via holes that are smaller than um, a typical coronavirus 0 0.007 uh, micrometers. So um, anyway, that's not how cloth masks work, uh, but if you're wearing a surgical mask, they have significantly uh, tighter filtration. And then that's the difference between the two of them. In terms of functionality, they're really not that functionally different. Um, one does obviously does filter more than the other, but in terms of eliminating um, relevant quantities of virus particles, those are like an amount of virus particle that could potentially make you sick. They're they're very similar. They're they're not exactly the same, obviously. Otherwise, they would just wear cloth masks in the hospital. But they are they're similar. So. Um, certainly cloth masks do have significant effectiveness. They're not as good as M95 masks, obviously, but they, but they do have significant effectiveness. This is by a total aside to what we were talking about. But anyway, there's the size of a bacteria. Like I said, it's about half a micron. We are going to talk about viruses later. And one thing to note about coronavirus is that it is a medium-sized virus. It's not the smallest virus out there, um, but it's also not the biggest virus out there. So it's so somewhere like in the middle. Um, and you can see see the viruses are ooh, maybe a tenth of the size of an average bacteria. Sometimes they're a hundredth the size of an average bacteria. Um, and sometimes they're half the size of an average bacteria. So again, there's a, there's a range of sizes. Um, but when you compare them to human cells, that's a red blood cell over there. That is the smallest human cell. So, and, and by a lot, by the way, red blood cells are considerably smaller than the average human cell. So bacteria are, are maybe a tenth the size or a 20th the size of a red blood cell. They're about a 50th or a 100th of a size of an average cell. That, that PM10 particle over there is a large particulate matter uh, particle. This must be about um, mask filtration or something because they got a lot of dust particles here. But uh, anyway, that, that PM10 particle there is... Mm, a little bit smaller than the average human cell. So the average human cell is probably around 10 to 20 micrometers, maybe about double that size. So again, if you look in comparison to a bacteria, to a single celled organism, they are very small. And viruses are even, again, much smaller than that. So they're, they're teeny tiny. Um, and I think it's fair to say that they are the dominant form of life on Earth because they live absolutely everywhere. Uh, there is no location on Earth, really, that doesn't have some type of prokaryote living in it. They live in the atmosphere, both lower and upper. Uh, they live in every layer of the lithosphere, the soil, all the way down to the molten level. Um, they live on virtually every surface on Earth. <laughs> So, I mean, they, they definitely are the dominant form of life in terms of their habitat. Um, they live on you, for sure. Uh, you are covered in bacteria. You probably have um, maybe a hundred trillion living on you, uh, <laughs> which is really hard to think about. I mean, the number a hundred trillion is a ludicrous number. You, you, you have as much bacteria in terms of numbers living on and inside of you as you do your own cells of your body. So that, that's a little bit difficult sort of concept to conceptualize, but you are covered. You are literally covered in bacteria from head to toe. So, and inside as well. So your, your upper digestive tract is not as highly populated by bacteria. Your mouth certainly is, and your esophagus, 
Uh, but you're, after your stomach, the your stomach acid does a fairly good job of removing living uh, prokaryotes. So you don't have a ton in your upper digestive tract. It's, it's, it's fairly small. Uh, but once you get to the uh, lower digestive tract, past the small intestine, so you get into the large intestine, the large intestine is absolutely chock full of bacteria. So much so that it actually makes up a sizable percentage of your bowel movements. So when you release waste, a large percentage of that mass that you're releasing is actually bacterial mass, which is kind of weird. But there, it's because there's a gigantic population of bacteria living inside your gut. And they are very important in terms of proper digestion. So anyway, let's let's talk about some reasons why we should care, okay? Oh, oh the, the last thing that I mentioned here is, is, the, is this idea that only about 1% of all of the prokaryotes have been identified. Uh, very few. Uh, we don't do a good job cataloging these. Uh, and every time we look at a soil sample or a water sample, uh, we find a whole bunch of DNA that we have not identified. So we have just scratched the surface in terms of understanding what is out there in terms of prokaryotes. If you're into microbio, I mean, here's an, here's an area of grad studies where you can really make an impact uh, in terms of identifying. And, and you know, we, we could probably, we could potentially find out a lot of useful things about these microorganisms in terms of their functionality. Uh, they may have uh, DNA that codes for all types of important um, products that we just have not discovered yet. One of the reasons why we've only been able to identify about 1% is that in large part, when we study these, we have to grow them. And a lot of uh, bacteria and, and archaea grow uh, require unique circumstances in order to grow them properly. Um, so we have a standard way that we grow prokaryotes in the lab. Uh, there are, it's basically just like sugar jelly. If, I mean, that's really what it is. It's just like a sugar jelly and you just grow bacteria on that a lot. And a lot of bacteria like to grow on that substrate, but there's also lots and lots of bacteria that do not grow well on that substrate or will not grow at all on that substrate. They require complex pH situations, complex um, re interactions with other organisms. They live um, in a uh, symbiotic relationship with the roots of plants, with fungi. Uh, and all of those different types of bacteria are very, very difficult to culture in the lab. And, and that, that makes it very difficult to identify and study them. So, so a lot of, the, of them are not well studied or understood. And again, maybe a place where you can make a big difference if you're interested in microbiome. So what are some potential things, some reasons why we should care about prokaryotes? Well, the one that I think most people focus on is the idea that some are pathogens. So pathogen just means illness causing agent. Um, so bubonic plague, bacterial meningitis, E. coli, Salmonella, leprosy, tuberculosis. Those are all pathogens. Uh, and those are, or I should say, pathologies that are caused by bacteria, so by pathogens. There's a lot. Um, but it's important to note that the bacteria that cause illness only make up a infinitesimally small fraction of the total bacteria that are out there. So we have this weird obsession. I mean, it's I guess it's not that weird. We care about our lives, but we, we tend to really obsess about pathogens. Uh, and so I think this has promoted this really weird, unhealthy idea of sterile is best. You, you, you hear this all the time. I got to get my antibacterial soap. I got to get my antibacterial spray I, or whatever and just like spray it all down sterilize it all and there are circumstances where you want sterility obviously i mean in surgery <laughs> you want it to be sterile so you don't get a post-op infection again that's pathogen related before you eat you want to sterilize your hands so that you don't you know potentially ingest pathogens this is all sensible that makes it total sense now i should mention that you do not need antibacterial soap in order to kill bacteria. Soap itself, just soap, 
does an absolutely excellent job of killing bacteria by itself. Uh, it also destroys virus particles. And I'm talking about just soap. It doesn't have to have anything else in it, just soap. Uh, and people don't realize that. But in order, to, in order for the soap to work, you do have to lather your hands for 20 seconds while you're washing, which most people don't do. Uh, but if you do that, the soap works perfectly fine. In fact, it works extremely well in removing bacteria and destroying virus particles as well. Uh, but antibacterial soap is totally useless. I mean, it's completely unnecessary. Um, there are reasons why you shouldn't use it, by the way, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the evolution unit. But um, but there, certainly there, you want to sterilize the environment for certain reasons, and that makes sense. However, there are lots of other things that you would potentially not want to sterilize. Uh, you probably don't want to sterilize completely the environment of your child uh, because your immune system learns how to identify a pathogen from an innocent bacteria by exposure. Uh, and sure, do little kids get little runny noses and minor, sick, minor, minor illnesses when they are exposed to these agents? Yes, they do. Uh, and that is a normal part of training your immune system as, as you grow up. There is significant evidence to suggest that if you sterilize a child's environment, their immune system is not properly trained into what is and is not a pathogen, and they end up being allergic way, way more often to many different things than children who were not placed in a sterile environment. In other words, you've, you've short-circuited their training of their immune system as a child. Uh, and so th there are negative repercussions to constantly sterilizing your environment. Uh, this is real, by the way. <laughs> the um, same thing goes for things like antibiotics. Um, people don't seem to care that when you take antibiotics for something that you really don't need antibiotics for, um, you sterilize your intestines, your large intestine. And most of the bacteria living in there, if not all, well, not all, there's definitely harmful strains of E. coli in there, but the vast majority of the bacteria in there are healthy for you. When you remove them, you, you create a situation where you could potentially cause some serious problems with your bowel. Uh, when it repopulates with bacteria, there's, a, there's uh, certainly the possibility that you can get serious inflammatory illnesses from removing all of the bacteria from your bowel. Um, and, 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 and anyways, these bacteria have important roles in maintaining your body, providing you nutrients, maintaining the pH of your skin, removing waste products from your skin. We live in a symbiotic relationship with many of these microorganisms. Uh, and it's not just us. Virtually every species has some type of symbiotic relationship with microorganisms. Plants do. Uh, and you, probably, you talked about this in grade nine. There are microorganisms that make nitrogen compounds for them to use as fertilizer. Um, there are microorganisms that are part of the, well, they're soil decomposers, um, they allow intercellular or and, and interspecies even communication uh, between roots in a forest. Uh, fungi play a role there as well. Anyway, there's all kinds of roles that, that these microbes are playing. And so it's really important not to get the idea in your head that bacteria means pathogens. That, that is a, it's a total misunderstanding of the diversity of bacteria. There are times where you want to remove pathogens, but it's important not to get carried away. <laughs> Don't think of microorganisms as being exclusively pathogenic because that is a complete misunderstanding of their role in nature. So what are some of the other roles then? Decom as I mentioned this, decomposers, they break down nutrients and cycle them. You know that. Uh, they are producers. So they form the bottom of many food webs, especially in aquatic ecosystems. They do a lot of the photosynthesis, producing of sugars, uh, and producing of oxygen. Uh, the vast majority of the oxygen that is produced and the CO2 that is taken up is done by aquatic microorganisms, mostly bacteria, uh, although there's some archaea involved there as well. But the um, a large percentage of Earth's photosynthesis is done by, by um, prokaryotes. I mentioned nitrogen fixation already, the idea that they provide fertilizer for plants. I mean, this is absolutely essential for life on Earth. They live in your digestive tract. There is a combination of bacteria and archaea living in your digestive tract. They produce important vitamins like vitamin K and B12. 
They also produce a number of complex carbohydrates that you require for building cellular structures, uh, including special neurological chemicals that your body requires. So these bacteria in your gut are essential to life. Uh, certainly they're essential to proper gut health. So um, something to consider. Uh, and we also use them for all kinds of commercial purposes. Uh, we use them to make yogurt and cheese. Uh, we use them for all types of synthetic molecule production. A great example of that is insulin. So if you're diabetic, uh, you may wonder, where does my insulin come from that I take? There's a lot of discussion in the U.S. about insulin and about it being so expensive per shot. It is quite expensive. But where does it come from? Well, we have bacteria make it for us which is really cool. So we, we took the human gene, that's a piece of our DNA that makes insulin. We popped that into some E. coli. We grew it in a vat. And then those E. coli made insulin for us. Uh, that's amazing. So you can harvest the insulin uh, and then you can inject it. And it is exactly the same as human insulin. It is molecule, molecularly identical. Uh, really cool. Before that, before we made insulin uh, via bacterial transformation, which is what that process is called, um, we used to do it with dogs, which is really sad, actually. So, like, um, prior to, I don't know when they started doing it with bacteria, the 1980s, 1970s, they, um, they used to take dogs, tie off their pancreases, which is where insulin is made. Uh, the pancreas would swell up. Uh, and then they would harvest the pancreases from dogs and then harvest the insulin from them, which, which kills the dogs. Um, but it was the only method that we knew of to produce insulin. Uh, and dog insulin is very similar molecularly to human insulin. It works the same for humans. Um, and so that was, that was how we used to get insulin. A sad story. Uh, but we didn't have another option. Before we did it with dogs, there was no treatment for diabetes. So especially people that had type 1 diabetes, it was always fatal. Uh, people did not live very long that had diabetes. So, uh, and I'm talking about diabetes mellitus here, uh, diabetes, uh, type 1 diabetes. Although some people are treated with insulin and type 2 diabetes as well, but it's a little bit more complex there. But anyway, I think that's so cool. So now we're able to do that with uh, bacteria. We can use bacteria for other purposes. We can have them break down plastics. We can have them do all kinds of jobs just by engineering them. So what do these guys actually look like? Let's take a look at a picture of one. I'm going to go through these different points that are on here one by one. So don't feel like you have to uh, uh, just get all this uh, information down all, all at once here. Because I'm going I'm to go through point by point. So first of all, if we look on the outside of the bacteria, you'll see that they have a protective layer around the outside called a capsule. So that the purpose of the capsule around the outside, and, and virtually all bacteria have this, I should mention that archaea are structured similarly. They have a slightly different peptidoglycan layer. Okay, that's the cell wall. The cell wall layer is a little bit different in archaea. But other than the cell wall difference, they are essentially identical. So you, you wouldn't really be able to look at an archaea and a bacteria and know the difference by looking at them. And, and again, very recently we discovered that they are different. So anyway, there's a capsule around the outside. It prevents water loss, so uh, bacteria don't like to be dried out, uh, and it protects from viruses. So there are specific viruses that target bacteria. They're called bacteriophages, uh, and there is some protection from bacteriophages offered by the capsule. It's not, not perfect protection uh, because many of them are susceptible to, virus, to viruses. Uh, and the capsule also provides a little bit of protection from temperature change. So there is a temperature range at which bacteria can survive. Um, generally on the low end, they're very resistant to low temperatures. So bacteria have a tendency to survive extreme cold. They can be frozen often, although some of them lice, some of them rupture um, when they're frozen. A lot of them do not. Uh, so if you freeze something in your freezer, you're not actually killing the bacteria in it. You do uh, basically put them in hibernation. They're not able to carry out their uh, reproductive processes uh, below freezing, usually. Usually. There are some archaea that can do that, but, but bacteria just generally cannot. So you're sort of freezing them in their life cycle. When you put them in, in the freezer, you're pausing their life cycle. 
Uh, on the other end, um, most bacteria can survive relatively hot temperatures. Uh, 40 degrees C, no problem. Uh, they probably prefer that. Body temperature, especially for pathogens, is a great temperature for prokaryotes. They love body temperature. Uh, so, for example, if you have a hot tub and you don't put any uh, anything in it <laughs> to prevent the growth of bacteria, you are going to get some bacteria growing in there. That's That's essentially the perfect environment for some bacteria. Some nice body temperature water. Uh, they love that. But if you start getting up into the 50 degrees C area, eh, we're starting to get into a, a scenario that's a little bit difficult for bacteria to survive, um, although there's a range. And once you get up into the 60, 70, 80 degrees area, now we're starting to get into fatal for most bacteria. If you're trying to sterilize water at that temperature, you have to keep it at that temperature for a while to actually kill all the bacteria. At 70 degrees, I'd have to look this up, but it's several hours. Uh, but if you get them to boiling all the way to 100 degrees C, you can kill bacteria in about a minute. So in about a minute of boiling, there's pretty much nothing that can survive that for bacteria. For archaea, there are some forms of archaea that prefer to live in boiling water. Uh, which is really cool. We're going to talk about those in a second. I'm going to come back to that because I'll, I'll discuss archaea separately here. But for bacteria, fatal. Okay, so what else do they have? They have an outer membrane. Okay, so they have that capsule on the very outside. Oh, sorry, I should go in order here. There is a peptidoglycan layer. So peptidoglycan means protein sugar. Okay, the gly part is the sugar part. The peptid part is the protein part. So a protein sugar layer. Um, and it is a large chain of molecules that goes around the outside and sort of helps hold the shape of the bacteria. That's part of its cell wall. So the cell wall is actually an outer membrane that is on the outside of the cell wall plus that peptidoglycan layer that sits just inside of the outer layer, outer membrane. So the outer membrane is very similar to what your cell membrane would do, uh, which is that it has pores, it has pumps, that can control the entry and exit of things. Like you, you know what your cell membrane does. It, it like allows things to go in and out of your cell. So that's what the outer membrane does of a bacteria as well. It brings in food, pumps out waste. And then right underneath that, the peptidoglycan layer is structural. So it like helps the bacteria hold its shape. So that's sort of like the general layout uh, this particular one that I pulled, I pulled this image, I think, from the textbook, um, has a flagella at the bottom. The flagella is sometimes there. A lot of bacteria don't have a flagella. I would say probably most of them don't. But they could, they can be, it can be used for propulsion. So they, it can potentially propel the bacteria around. The bacteria also have DNA in them, as all living things do. And that DNA is, just like it is in you, the plan for building all of the structures of the bacteria. So there's usually a big, long loop of DNA. We don't have loops, by the way. Eukaryotes have strips of DNA that are separate. They're called chromosomes. We're going to talk about those more later. But um, bacteria typically have one big long loop of DNA, and it actually is a loop. It's a closed loop, a big circle, sort of like a rubber band that's like kind of folded up on itself. Uh, and they also have secondary little loops of DNA, smaller loops called plasmids. Okay, um, the, the cool thing about that is a lot of the interesting functions of a particular strain of bacteria are, are in those plasmids. And because they are these tiny little loops, they can actually exchange those loops with their neighbors. They're able to pass some of their genetic information on to neighboring bacteria. That's called horizontal gene transfer. And the reason that it's horizontal is because it's giving that information to someone of the same generation as it. We don't have that, obviously, as humans. We can't give genes that we have to your brother or something or another living human that's, you know, mature. The only way we can pass genes on is through reproduction. We can give some of our genes to our children. 
uh, and that would be vertical gene transfer, that you're transferring genes down to the next generation. But bacteria have a cool little sort of side chain here that they can give genes to their neighbors. And that, that allows them to, for example, share genes for antibiotic resistance or share genes for making a certain protein or whatever. This is partially what we take advantage of when we build or when we engineer bacteria to do things for us. So when we engineer bacteria to do things for us, what we're actually doing is uh, giving them plasmids that we build, we build our own plasmids, give them to the bacteria, and then they do whatever job we tell them to do in the plasmid. It's like a little set of instructions we get them to follow. One of the differences between that bacterial DNA and our DNA is that bacterial DNA has no introns. An intron is a section of DNA that doesn't really do anything. It, it's, it's basically just like extra DNA that is used to control when certain genes are on or off. As in tell a gene, okay, make this thing, make this thing, don't make this thing, make this thing. Um, we have those sections in our DNA. And that's because we have different tissues. Your eye cells and your skin cells and your liver cells have different pieces of their DNA turned on and off. So uh, obviously, like the cells look completely different in those different regions because some of them are using some parts of the DNA and some of them are using other parts. Bacteria don't have that. So they don't have no introns. They only have the instructions. It's pure instruction. Uh, so that is one difference between them and eukaryotic organisms. And uh, so I mentioned this over here, that there are these little structures on the outside called pili. Let's zoom out a little bit here. Uh, and those pili are how the bacteria actually exchange genes with their neighbors. So when they exchange genes with their neighbors, when they give a piece of their, their DNA to a neighbor, which is, it's called bacterial conjugation. I wrote it right here. Conjugation. Um, they give some of their genes to their neighbor and their neighbor gives some of their genes to them. Uh, it's an exchange of genes and I mentioned it's called horizontal gene transfer. And it's handy because it increases genetic diversity. And as we've previously mentioned, increasing genetic diversity is how species become resilient and stay alive. So it is a tool for making your species more robust and more resistant to environmental change. Anytime you're increasing genetic diversity in an organism, it's always a positive. It always increases the survivability. Again, that's one of those um, themes that you're going to see throughout this unit and pretty much all the units, which is that genetic diversity and diversity in general is the key to survival of a species. Uh, I also mentioned this idea that we can give bacteria DNA. Uh, we don't have pili, so we can't give it to them through conjugation, but we can just make the bacteria suck up the DNA from their environment and incorporate it. And that process is called bacterial transformation. I mentioned that earlier, but that's, that's the idea that we can put some uh, genetic information into the surroundings of the bacteria and have them suck up that, back, that information and use it. So that's a process called bacterial transformation. If you take the grade 12 course, uh, and hopefully things are gonna be settling down to a little bit more normal next year, uh, you do a bacterial con uh, transformation in the grade 12 course, which is really cool. You actually transform some bacteria to make them glow in the dark. So you incorporate a new gene into the bacteria which produces a protein which glows in the dark. So um, it's quite a cool experiment. How am I doing here? Okay, I'm gonna pause here for a second. I actually have to get a drink of water. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna keep everybody busy. I'm gonna have you uh, watch this summary video right here on prokaryotes, uh, bacteria and archaea. It's about six minutes long. Uh, and so I'm gonna come back here at 9.35. Okay, so I'm gonna get you to watch this video right now. It's on Brightspace and I will see you at 9.35. Sorry, Andrea, sorry. Um, all of the content for any particular page is always on the tab for that day. So everything's organized by day. So today's day three. 
So any, any reference that I'm going to make to any content will always be on that day three tab. Uh, just just so you guys know, and this is an optional video. I should probably put right in the uh, description there. That's, I didn't mean the one that we watched. That one wasn't optional. <laughs> but the one right below it, uh, where it says, watch this fascinating TED Talk on how bacteria communicate, that is an optional video. So that one is about quorum sensing. So if you're really interested in microorganisms and how they communicate with each other or within their own species, uh, it, it sounds even crazy to think that they would communicate because they're so simple. Um, but they do have the ability to communicate through chemical messengers with each other. Uh, and so this, this TED Talk, which is, I think, 10 or 12 minutes long, goes into a little bit more detail on how bacteria actually do that communication with each other. You do not need to watch that if you're not interested in it, but I, I provide it as an extra. Often students are like, oh, I'm, in, I'm interested in this thing. Could you please, you know, give me some additional thing to look at. And this that, that this is sort of like, what would you call that? Enrichment, an enrichment opportunity. Yeah, I'm gonna keep going here. Um, so I mentioned that this is the general shape that you find bacteria in. Um, they don't all look exactly like this. So I'm gonna talk about the three main body shapes. I don't know if you can call them bodies, cell shapes, I guess, that you find bacteria in. Uh, and those are cocci, bacilli, and spirilla. Okay, so you can see the three of them right here. Cocci is essentially a sphere. Bacilli is a, what would you call that? A cylinder, <laughs> a, cil a tube, <laughs> looks kind of like a tiny worm. Uh, and a spirilla is pretty much exactly what you'd think it would be, it's a spiral. A spiral tube okay so these are the three most common formats that you find uh, these bacterial body shapes in um, and they come in various uh, arrangements and typically part of the naming structure for prokaryotes includes this body structure information not always not always so this is one strategy that is used for differentiating between bacteria and because there is so much diversity in the genetic material in bacteria and in the, what their cell wall is made out of and proteins and things like that differ greatly from species to species uh, while these shapes are largely the same between species this is only one aspect of how they are structured taxonomically, like how they are um, not structured, how they are classified taxonomically. So just something to keep in mind, um, sometimes bacteria are named based on their shape, but often the shape is not relevant to their naming, just so you know. Okay, so, but, the, but I'm gonna provide some examples here of, of some bacteria that are definitely named based on their shape. Um, so for example, if you are a cocci bacteria and you are typically found in groups of two, okay, so that that is known as a diplococci. Okay, diplo just means two, cocci means sphere. So a diplococci or a diplococcus bacteria is one that is found in twos, okay, two spheres. There are also staphylococcus bacteria, bacteria or staphylococci. Uh, a staphylo basically just means a clump. So staphylococci are, is just a clump of cocci, a, a clump of spheres. Okay. Uh, these are also known as staph bacteria. And you, you've, you've probably heard of staph before. Actually, maybe you haven't. But like, for example, let me give you an example of a staphylococci bacteria. Staph aureus, staphylococcus aureus. Um, or short form down to S. aureus often, uh, is just a common skin infection. This one is usually problematic at the gym. So, uh, oh man, I got, I got a staph infection at the gym. Or, oh, I got a staph infection at the wrestling tournament. Because this is a fairly contagious uh, skin uh, infection that is fairly easily transmissible through contact or through contact with 
shared equipment. So when you, when you see people sterilizing gym equipment at the gym, uh, they like wipe it down with the disinfectant after they use it. It's mostly to prevent staph infections from being transmitted between people. I, guess, I suppose now it would be for COVID as well because that uh, the sterile solution probably, probably sterilizing solution probably kills COVID as well, I would assume. But um, or maybe they use a different sterilizing solution now. But it, it, it is mostly to kill Staph aureus. Um, and because those those infections are, like I said, they're highly contagious. And so they often um, get spread quite easily, especially between athletes, because there's a lot of contact there. So that's an example of a Staph type infection. You can also get a strip of cocci, a strepto cocci. Uh, and that, that's ex again, exactly what you think it is. It's a strip uh, where they come sort of in like a long lineup of a whole bunch of them. Uh, so a streptococci is a strip of cocci. And then an example of that would be the bacteria that causes strep throat, which you've probably heard of getting a strep infection uh, in your throat. Streptococcus pharyngitis is, or S pharyngitis, is a common uh, pharyngeal infection called strep throat or it causes strep throat rather you can also by the way get viral strep throat which is a lot less serious than streptococcus pharyngitis um, but there's no way to treat viral a uh, strep throat uh, right it's not really it's not called strep throat but a viral throat infection but because uh, you can't use antibiotics on viruses so um, in that case, you just need to wait it out. But if you have a streptococcus infection, you can usually treat it with antibiotics. That's why, that's why they test you. If you've ever had a really bad sore throat and you've gone to see the doctor, they swab it and they test it for strep bacteria. If it is positive for strep bacteria, then you can prescribe antibiotics because it will kill it. Um, but if it comes negative for strep bacteria, then there is no treatment for it. So there's, there's nothing for you to do except go home and wait it out. <laughs> anyway. So those are some basic, um, some basic terminology for um, labeling the um, uh, structure of bacteria. Keep in mind that these prefixes, diplo, staphylo, and strepto, can also apply to the other shapes. So you can have a diplobacilli, a staphylobacilli, and a streptobacilli. And technically, you can also have a diplosporilla, staphylosporilla, and a streptosporilla. Okay, so those prefixes, strepto, staphylo, and diplo, which means two, clump, and strip, um, can be applied to any of the shapes of bacteria. And there are many types of bacteria, as, as mentioned here, that are named based on their shapes. There are lots that are not, <laughs> um, but it is one of the ways in which bacteria are named. Another way that you could potentially distinguish between types of bacteria, so instead of looking at their shapes, you could categorize them based on where they get their energy. Okay, so there are some bacteria that are autotrophic. Autotroph means self-feeding. In other words, it produces its own fuel often through photosynthesis. It's usually through photosynthesis, although there are some other processes. There are chemoautotrophs uh, that use specific chemicals um, in the natural environment to produce their own energy molecules, uh, like those that live at the bottom of the ocean and stuff like that. They don't have access to light. So, um, But typically, uh, autotrophs use photosynthesis. Uh, you guys know that process, photosynthesis. You've probably seen that before. That's carbo, uh, carbo, carbon dioxide and water a reaction that happens with light and then you produce sugar molecules and oxygen. I also previously mentioned that bacteria make up a lot of the producers in aquatic ecosystems and so this is just an example of that. So there are some many that do photosynthesis. There's also lots of bacteria that are heterotrophic. Heterotroph just means you rely on some other organism for your energy source. Uh, hetero just means opposite troph. You're, you, eat, you eat, or other, I guess hetero would be other. Other troph, other food. Something else is the food. That'd be bacteria that eat other stuff. 
You can also classify bacteria based on whether or not they need oxygen to live. So oftentimes you'll see bacteria categorized as an aerobe. An aerobe is something that requires oxygen. If it's an obligate aerobe, obligate, obligate means you need it. So an obligate aerobe bacteria means it must have oxygen in order for it to survive. That's an obligate aerobe. Or your bacteria could be a facultative aerobe. Facultative means that it prefers oxygen. It doesn't need it, so it can survive without oxygen, but it prefers oxygen for its survival. It's a facultative aerobe. There are also bacteria that hate oxygen. <laughs> so bacteria that can't stand oxygen, that will die in the presence of oxygen, are called obligate anaerobes. In other words, they need an oxygen-free environment to survive. And I didn't write it down here, but there are also facultative anaerobes. A facultative anaerobe is a bacteria that would prefer an oxygen-free environment, but it can survive with oxygen. The oxygen doesn't kill it, it just means that it grows slower. So you can be a obligate aerobe, a facultative aerobe, an obligate anaerobe, or a facultative anaerobe. And again, these are the reason we're talking about this is these are different ways in which bacteria can be classified. They are often classified because of these particular features. Just as a quick reminder, all of the completed notes are posted in the course notes folder on Brightspace. It's one of the tabs across the very top. Um, so if you're ever looking for these, you're like, oh, I missed this one part here. I don't, didn't see what that said. You can always open the PDFs. They're there. Uh, if I make any kind of significant alteration to the notes, I always upload a new copy so that the most recent one is available there for you. Also, as a quick aside, um, bacteria reproduce through a process called binary division. Um, in binary division, one bacteria duplicates its DNA and then cuts itself in half, making two daughters. This may look a lot like mitosis. It is, the outcome is the same as mitosis in that you have replicated everything and then you cut your cell in half. But there are some really large differences between this process and mitosis. Pretty much all of the biochemistry involved is different. Um, if you'll remember in mitosis, you have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And in prophase, you get this like, Conden con condensing of the DNA and then they turn it like these little X's and you line the X's up and stuff. None of that happens in bacteria. So so the process on a biochemical level looks completely different, but the, the outcome is the same, which is that you're making an identical copy of the bacterial cell. So that exists. Um, uh, when I'm done talking here, I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to complete question four here. Uh, in order to do that, I'm going to get you to take a look at page 51 in the textbook. What it does is it goes through uh, a number of bacterial diseases. I know I don't like to focus on um, pathogens, but they, they are important for human health. So we are going <laughs> to we'll at least take a look at them. Um, bacteria are are responsible for a number of human illnesses and I'm going to get you just to record some of them here. So have a look at some of the ones that exist and provide some examples here which bacteria cause which illnesses and this is just you know kind of important for you to know what bacterial illnesses are out there and keep in mind that if an illness is bacterial it can usually be treated with antibiotics uh, and so it probably is a good idea for you to have some idea of what things can be treated with antibiotics. If they're not caused by a bacteria, they usually cannot be treated with antibiotics. Um, so, and people often go to the doctor and ask for antibiotics for things that 
you can't use antibiotics for. So um, this is some good information for you to know. I'm going to get you to come back and do this when we're done, which will be in a few minutes. One thing I wanted to talk about here is, and I'm going to do this question with you together, which is how do you get antibiotic resistance? So how do, how do bacteria build up antibiotic resistance? This is a huge, huge problem, which is that we use antibiotics all the time for everything, even when it's inappropriate to use them. And we end up creating situations where we are evolving bacteria to be resistant to antibiotics. If you got tuberculosis, for example, okay, it's not super common in North America, but there are lots of places in the world where it's relatively common. India is a good example. Uh, 30 years ago, I would say to you, you will definitely get rid of your tuberculosis. We are going to give you some antibiotics. Uh, and then it's a, it's a really long course, unfortunately. That's like six month course of antibiotics. But when you're done your course of antibiotics, you will be tuberculosis free. We can remove tuberculosis from you and make you healthy again. Unfortunately, due to the overuse of antibiotics, we don't always have that option any longer. There are highly antibiotic resistant strains of tuberculosis. They're called superbugs. Uh, and there are cases where we just simply can no longer treat your tuberculosis. In other words, you will probably have tuberculosis for the rest of your life. That sucks. Uh, and we did that. Uh, as another example, there are strains of chlamydia that are extremely difficult to treat with antibiotics. It used to be a no-brainer. If you get chlamydia, we can treat that. We have antibiotics, we can get rid of it, no problem. But now there are strains of multi, uh, anti, anti, uh, back, anti, sorry, multi, uh, strains of multi, anti, well, I'm having difficulty with my words right here. Um, strains of multi-antibiotic resistant <laughs> um, chlamydia out there so we that we can no longer always treat your chlamydia. Uh, that's really problematic. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how that process works and maybe we can briefly talk about some ways that we can prevent that from happening. So I want you to imagine a population of bacteria and remember that all species and all populations have some measure of genetic diversity in them, okay? So in this population of bacteria, and I'm going to use the antibiotic erythromycin, which is a common antibiotic that's used, um, as an example here, okay? So within this population of bacteria, those are my circles on the left here, there are some in the population that are always killed by erythromycin. They are very susceptible to erythromycin, and that will probably be the largest percentage of the bacteria as long as it's not resistant. And then there will be some of them that are often killed by erythromycin, and this is due to genetic differences, remember? This is just, this is just random variability in the population. And then you're going to have a few that are resistant to erythromycin. You always have a few. Okay, This is just due to random genetic mutation. So when you treat somebody with an infection, bacterial infection. You treat them with antibiotics. And what you're attempting to do is remove the vast majority of the bacteria through the antibiotic and then allowing their immune system to essentially mop up a couple stragglers. Okay? And those are primarily the resistant ones. So you treat them and you end up with... A, population of bacteria that looks like this. Okay? So imagine that. You have done that. Well, one of the things that you need to make sure that you do when you take antibiotics is that you take the full course. Even though you're feeling better, you take the course right to the end. And the reason for that is to make sure that you get the absolute most minimal population of bacteria at the end. Because if you leave too many of these behind, what ends up happening is that there may be too many for your immune system to remove. And so you're going to get a regrowth of those bacteria, but 
instead of your population looking like this, your population is now going to be made only from the members that survived. Okay, And those just happen to be the most resistant members of the population. So what, what's going to end up, what, what the population looks like afterwards is like this. Okay, so you'll notice that all the bacteria that were easily killed by the antibiotic are gone. They, they're not part of the, the new population anymore. So what you've just seen happen here is evolution. This is the definition of evolution. We've seen a change in the frequency of the genes in a particular population. And when we get to evolution, we'll, we'll talk more about how this works. But, but this is evolution. This is what we're seeing in front of us here. Okay, So we're, we've forced these bacteria to evolve by changing their environment. And now, when you try and treat this population with the antibiotic, you will find it is much more difficult to kill these bacteria because you've, you've regrown the population from only resistant members of the population. You may, you may be able to still eliminate the uh, infection using that antibiotic, uh, but you may not. And what happens over time is if you, let's say, okay, now I can't treat this with erythromycin, okay? But I could treat it with, uh, pick another, pick another antibiotic, okay? There are several. Well, you could end up create, doing this again, except just making them resistant to another particular antibiotic. And so as this gets passed from human to human, from human to human, and you treat, and you have an occasion where you create a resistant strain, uh, and you do this again and again and again, eventually you end up with a bacteria that is resistant to all antibiotics. Nothing can treat it any longer. And then you get a superbug. And so over the past 60 years, since the invention of antibiotics, we've been progressively doing this. Uh, and we've been creating superbugs, unfortunately, and there is no way to treat them, uh, which is, is really problematic. So um, one of the ways to combat this is to make sure that you take the entire course of antibiotics when you do take antibiotics. The other way to combat this is to not take antibiotics unless you absolutely need them. There are many infections that don't require antibiotic treatment. People, people request it from their doctor because they would prefer antibiotics for whatever reason. It makes them feel better, I guess. But they may have no effect or they're not even appropriate to prescribe in a particular circumstance. Uh, if your child has an ear infection, most of the time, unless it's a very severe ear infection, you don't need antibiotic treatment for that. That will just resolve on its own. Uh, and there are criteria that doctors use to determine whether or not you should be prescribing um, antibiotics. But most of the time, you're not supposed to. But they do it because parents you know, beg and plead and say, oh, you know, little Billy's ear is so sore. Uh, and then we end up prescribing antibiotics when we shouldn't be prescribing them. So the overuse is a real problem here. Uh, and then the other the other thing is we have a tendency to use antibiotics when there is no infection, not in humans. So this is not common in humans. However, we do it in animals all the time. So I'm going to use the U.S. as an example. Sorry, U.S. I'm going to throw you under the bus here because we don't really do this in Canada. But in the U.S., in farming, often uh, animals will just be given antibiotics continuously. You just give all of your cattle erythromycin. All the time and yes does it prevent them from getting sick sure it keeps more cattle more healthy more of the time however what you're doing is you're creating this scenario happening all the time within your population of cattle and not just in the cattle either a lot of that antibiotic passes through your cattle and into the urine and into the natural environment and creates a natural environment where we're producing resistant strains of bacteria in the environment uh, and this is a problem for humans as well, by the way. A lot of the antibiotics that we consume go into the water. Uh, and then we can't really remove them that well through water treatment. So they end up in our waterways. Uh, sometimes they're recycled back into our drinking water again. Um, yes, yeah, so, and so this stuff is very problematic. 
So you can imagine how this situation is. Uh, this is a bad idea. And so a lot of work needs to be done in this area. Um, and that's how we're, it's, it's evolution. We're forcing the evolution of microbes um, to be resistant to antibiotics and we're removing ways to treat bacterial illnesses. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop talking about this because it's a little bit depressing, um, but I just, I wanted to point that out. Something that you should be aware of where antibiotic resistance comes from. That's all I'm gonna say about bacteria. I'm gonna spend a few minutes here just really quickly discussing uh, archaea, and then I'm going to give you an opportunity to work on all of the prokaryotic stuff. So what's the difference between archaea and bacteria? Well, from a physical perspective, not a lot. Um, most archaea do not have that peptidoglycan layer. So going back up to the cell wall here, where we mentioned that the cell wall has an outer membrane and then a peptidoglycan layer. The archaea do not have the peptidoglycan layer. So that, that's, that's a major structural difference. You can't really see it under the microscope, but it's not there. So that's one thing. The other thing that is largely different between the two groups is archaea have a tendency to inhabit extreme environments. And they're usually named based on their particular extreme environment adaptation. And in my opinion, this is what makes them so cool because the places that they live are places where you're like, well, nothing lives there except Archaea. Archaea is like the exception. So I'm going to give you some examples here of the class or grouping of Archaea and where they potentially live. So one of them uh, has a tendency to live in your gut. Okay, they're methanogens. And as part of their metabolism, they produce a fair amount of methane. This is the component of the bacteria in your gut that is producing gas. Okay, uh, so that, that is a function of their metabolism. Um, ruminants, uh, ruminants like uh, cattle and stuff like that have a large population of these in their stomachs, which is why cattle produce uh, so much methane. So methanogens produce methane. I wouldn't, I'm not sure I would call your gut an extreme environment, but this is a large class of uh, archaea. There is also another large class of archaea called halophiles, uh, and they are able to adapt and live in a very high salt content environment. They can live on salt flats. So typically salt, because it draws water out of things, that's why it's used as a preservative, um, it prevents most cellular growth of all kinds. If you look at a salt flat, what lives on a salt flat? Nothing, nothing, there's no plants. Uh, there's no fungus, <laughs> nothing lives on a salt flat except halophiles, except archaea. So they are especially adapted to live on very in very salty environments. So that, that's kind of cool. So they're literally the only things that can live there. Um, there are extreme thermophiles. Extreme thermophiles are archaea that can live in very, very hot temperatures over boiling. So there are some archaea that are adapted to live in temperatures up to 114 degrees Celsius. And they actually prefer those temperatures. That's when they replicate the fastest and they, their metabolism works best at an extremely high temperature. That temperature would destroy the cell membrane of all other living things on earth. Nothing else has the ability to survive at that temperature. I mean, you would die. <laughs> you would die right away if you were exposed to temperatures like that. Um, and as would any other organism on Earth. So they are specially adapted. They live on the things like uh, on places like the sides of volcanoes, within volcanoes. Not, I mean, not in the lava, but on the sides of the inside of the volcano where it's extremely hot. Um, and they also have uh, the ability to live inside of thermal vents and pools, which can be boiling, boiling water. One really cool example of that I don't know if anybody in the class has been to Yellowstone before absolutely amazing park if you're interested in archaea I highly recommend it it's also beautiful uh, I went there a few years ago and I saw this for the first time this is called the Grand Prismatic Spring uh, and that is a pool of boiling water 
that is coming up from a uh, thermal spring. Uh, it's a very volcanically active area. And the beautiful colors that you see are actually different species of archaea. So the darkest blue and the light blue areas are inhabited by archaea that prefer extremely hot temperatures above boiling. And as you move towards the outside of the thermal pool, the yellow, orange, and red species are progressively prefer cooler and cooler environments. So that the te actual temperature of the water goes down uh, towards the fringes. And so the species of bacteria that you get towards the edges is slightly different. And so you get these this different species, and the different species are different colors, uh, which gives you this really cool rainbow effect. And there are a number of these different pools at Yellowstone. This is the most famous one, uh, but it's really beautiful. Highly recommended if you ever get a chance to go to Yellowstone. Uh, you, if you go there on a cooler day, you get all like the fog and like the steam coming up from the the boiling uh, crater. It's it's pretty cool. See, it, it, I mean, just to look at the picture, it looks fake. <laughs> it looks like that's not even a real place, but it is. Um, so you've got archaea that prefer really hot environments. Those are extreme thermophiles. And then you also have archaea that thrive in very cold environments, sub-freezing. Uh, they can reproduce perfectly fine at those temperatures. And th those uh, archaea are called psychrophiles. Kind of a cool name. Psychrophiles are well adapted to live in very, very cold environments like the high Arctic. If you look through a column of ice in the Arctic, you're not gonna find a lot of living things in there, as you might expect, as you might expect. Uh, there's no fungus or anything that lives at that temperature. So pretty much the only living thing that you will find in that sample of ice is archaea, and they live in there, which is, again, I think is cool. These are not pathogenic, as far as I know, there's no species of archaea that's a pathogen, um, but uh, they make their way in the world in these really uh, hostile environments. So that's one of the ways that you can sort of separate them out from bacteria. They tend to live in more extreme environments, not in every case, but but they tend to. Okay, so what am I going to get you to do? I realize we're coming up to break time here. I will give you some more time to work on this, obviously, in block two. Uh, so please enjoy, take some time to enjoy your break. If we do f happen to fall behind, and it looks like we're probably going to a little bit, um, I will probably push the protist stuff to the next day. So don't don't feel like you're you're not going to get stuck. We'll we'll um, we'll move some stuff around to make sure that you get appropriate time. So so you hopefully already watched this video. There is the optional TED talk. You don't have to watch that. There is question four from the course notes. That does not need to go in your question document for this unit uh, because it's in the course notes. So anything in the course notes, you just do in the course notes. Uh, that's the question where I'm asking you just to have a look at the chart of illnesses that are caused by bacteria and note some examples in your notes. Uh, and then there are some analysis questions that go along with this. It is page 53 in your notes, numbers 3 and 14. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of time to work on this now. Uh, when we come back after the break, I'll see you at 11.05. We're going to take attendance. Uh, and then I am going to go through the virus content. And then I will give you time to work on both of those things. So these questions from the bacteria and archaea content. And then the questions. And there's a couple little videos that go along with the virus content. Okay, guys. I'm going to give you some time to work right now on those questions. And I will see you at 11.05. I'll be here the whole time. Ask me if you have any questions. Okay. Awesome. So I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to take a moment now and go through the virus content and then give you a chance to work on it. We'll see where we're at. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how long that's going to take. If it's a reasonable amount of time, we may start the protist content towards the end of the second block. If uh, that gentleman has gone from my basement. I can take this off now. If um, if it's more than that, uh, if it's taking up quite a bit of time in the second block, we'll we'll push the protist content to the next day. I'll let you know. Okay, we'll uh, I'll be very clear about it. So let me pull this up for you. Flavor was able to. Have a moment to stretch their legs. 
we're going to talk a little bit about viruses. I do have two good virus videos for you to watch. The first one here is a little bit about the different morphologies that exist in viruses and their life cycle, which I only I only just very basically touch on the idea of virus life cycle. But this video talks in a lot more depth about the lytic and the lysogenic cycle, which is really important information for people to know about viruses. That is, how does a virus reproduce? And uh, how can you get a virus that basically just hangs out in an organism's DNA? That's during the um, lysogenic cycle. And does nothing, basically. Hides. And then all of a sudden can go back into the lytic cycle again and begin reproducing and creating virus particles. So that that would be like a um, like herpes simplex virus. Perfect example if anybody has herpes. Very common, by the way. Um, herpes simplex 1. There are some estimates that say that 92% of the population has herpes simplex 1 by adulthood. So that I means that's, that's almost everybody. It's very, very common in the population. It's highly contagious. Uh, and that's what causes cold sores, by the way, uh, herpes simplex 1. Herpes simplex 2 also causes cold sores, uh, but it is more commonly experienced as genital herpes. It is a slightly different virus. It is also possible, though, to get herpes simplex 1 as genital herpes. They can both be genital herpes, but but it is, it's much more common to have them on the face. Anyway, so with, with a viral infection like herpes, um, obviously you have an outbreak of the viral infection, but you never get rid of it. You actually keep the viral infection uh, in the lysogenic cycle. And again, I'm not going to go into the details of the reproductive cycles. I'll leave that to this video. Um, but they basically hide out in your DNA for a while, and then under the right circumstances, they reemerge. So some viruses operate like that, where they can go into sort of a hibernetic uh, period. Um, not all viruses do that. So if you, for example, have a coronavirus, and I, and I don't necessarily just mean COVID-19. Co COVID-19 is a coronavirus, um, but you have had a coronavirus infection before. Not a COVID-19 infection. Well, I, I mean, you may have, but, um, but coronaviruses are very common. Uh, they typically cause colds, uh, and almost certainly you've had probably multiple coronavirus infections in your lifetime of different types of coronaviruses, which usually just cause a cold. So um, they're, they're extremely common. And those, are, those viruses do not typically have a lysogenic cycle where they hide in your DNA. So you don't end up having these like sort of um, infections that are recurrent where they keep coming and coming and coming over and over again. Uh, a chickenpox, uh, which is varicella zoster virus, is also one of a virus that is like that, where it hides in your DNA. So if you've ever had chickenpox, you still have chickenpox in you somewhere. Uh, the varicella zoster virus is hiding in one of your nerve roots, and it is possible to have a reinfection of chickenpox. Although it's, it's typically doesn't happen. Uh, but you can get a secondary infection, uh, another outbreak of varicella zoster in the form of shingles, which typically happens when you're older, although you can get it as a young person as well. Uh, stressful situations often um, depress your immune system enough that you have a reemergence of varicella zoster, uh, or, and, and it's also more common in the elderly, So, which can be very painful, by the way. Uh, it's not, not nice to get shingles. If you've been vaccinated, though, and we're going to talk a little bit about vaccinations, then you may never experience a varicella zoster infection. Hooray! It's really cool that you can get a uh, vaccine for um, chicken pox. You, that didn't exist when I was a kid. I had chicken pox, as did probably everybody I know. But um, you don't need to get it anymore. Anyway, there are a couple questions from the course notes as well. This second video, oh, I forgot to mention, the second video is uh, really cool. It talks about where new viruses come from. Uh, and this is a question I get all the time. Where did COVID come from? Great question. Uh, this, this video talks about the emergence of new viruses and how that process actually works. It's usually coming from a different host organism. Uh, in the case of COVID-19, the likely suspect is bats, although we, we haven't confirmed that. But, it, but based on some uh, 
coronavirus uh, subtypes that have been found in bats, there is a, a very close connection between that and COVID-19. And so it's likely that that has been the, the, uh, the origin of this particular virus. Uh, although, again, it's very difficult to confirm that precisely. It's not the exact same virus. There, a, a mutation has occurred to allow humans to become the host. So um, anyway, I'll let you watch that video as well. You really should. Um, and it's, it's very informative in terms of how viruses mutate and where new viruses originate from. I mean, it's very pertinent to our everyday lives. Um, that being said, um, the pathways with which viruses can be transmitted from another animal to humans where we can get new viral infections are predictable, or at least somewhat predictable. And so there are ways to minimize the emergence of new viruses. Um, and the video talks a little bit about how maybe the best job has not been done to restrict <laughs> The, uh, that in, in specifically with COVID-19. But anyway, um, some discussion there. Really interesting video. Highly, highly recommend it. You should watch it. Um, I also have an article right at the end here which discusses the connection between uh, autism and vaccines, which, again, this is a question that I get all the time. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about vaccines, which is why these questions are coming up. Um, but... Essentially, there is no connection between them at all. Uh, however, there is a controversy around this because of a scientist who had published some data, which in this published data, there was a tenuous connection that was um, established between autism and the MMR vaccine, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, uh, which has been completely discredited and retracted from publication since then. However, the damage, unfortunately, has already been done. Um, and so if you're interested in that story a little more, um, to get a little more details on uh, on like where that idea originated from and what has happened with that data, um, I encourage you to read this article. Um, many, many people seem to be misinformed about that particular issue, uh, which is really unfortunate. So this the science the scientist who published that original data, which was falsified, by the way, um, did the the global community a great disservice since it's very difficult to clear up those misunderstandings once they're in the public domain. Um, but anyway, if you're interested in more information about that, there's an article there on it. Many, many studies have been done since then looking at the connection between vaccines and a whole host of long-term side effects. And there are very, very few that have been found. Uh, and again, it, it does differ depending on the vaccine, um, but but we have not found any long-term effects uh, for really any vaccine. I shouldn't say that. There are some vaccines that do have some known long-term effects, um, like the uh, vaccine that is used for... Um, whew, I'm going to forget the name of that bacteria. Um, it's used to make a biological weapon, um, anthrax. So there are, uh, there are some known side effects of the anthrax vaccine. I mean, it's not a vaccine you'd ever get. It's usually for military personnel, but anyway, um, the vast majority of vaccines, have, there's never been any long-term health consequences observed with them. And if there is, they're usually removed from market. Perfect example, um, one of the COVID-19 vaccines is currently not being employed for those over the age of 30, I believe. Oh, I'm going to have to double check my data on that. Um, is, is it the Moderna vaccine? I'm not sure which one it is. Uh, and that, that was due to a very small increase in the number of blood clots uh, that are a, a potential side effect of the vaccine. Um, and they've only been observed in older people, not in any young people. Um, and the amount of increased blood clotting is extremely small. We're talking about one in millions. Uh, but even then, oh, is it AstraZeneca? You might be right, Andrea. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on this one. It might be AstraZeneca. Um, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. So I might be wrong on that. Um, I'm not in an age group that is susceptible anyway, and I've had the Pfizer vaccine already, so it's not super pertinent information for me. But um, anyway, the actual number of blood clotting incidents is extremely small, 
And so the we're not 100% sure uh, that the vaccine is actually the cause of that increased incidence in blood clotting. Um, no, the anthrax vaccine was developed before mRNA vaccine technology even existed. So no, <laughs> it's not. Um, and you you will you have not received the anthrax vaccine. <laughs> it's usually for active military personnel, and specifically those being deployed in areas where anthrax may be deployed as a biolog biological weapon. So I don't I don't think that that's particularly relevant for the general population. Um, younger people are having issues compared to what is normal in terms of blood clotting. But are, hold on. Are you are you sure about that, Brie? Hold on, I'm gonna double check on this now. L let me come back. Let me let me do a, a little investigation. I'm, I'm gonna come back and have a look at at who the what population is specifically affected by the increase in blood clotting. Now it is it's a younger population than is typically affected by blood clots, which is usually just the elderly. Um, but I don't believe that it is young people in general. Uh, I'm gonna double check that. I don't want, I don't want to give anybody any misinformation here. I'm gonna double check that. It is people under 55 which are not typically affected by blood clots. That is true. But but that population... Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. You're, you're right. But the, the number of people getting blood clots under the age of 55 is not necessarily out of pace with the number of people under 55 that experience blood clots just due to natural processes it, it, it's not unheard of for people to have blood clotting under the age of 55 it's a small increase in that number and it, when i talk about young people i mean i mean i consider myself to be young but under the age of 40 okay so let, let me get back to you. I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna look at that specific age group that is susceptible here but they ha they have changed the recommendations in terms of who should be vaccinated um i again i don't want to give any any misinformation about this so there is an example of something where there is a potential for um, a side effect, a long-term side effect. And when I say long-term, the blood clotting usually happens within, I have to look this up, within a few weeks of the vaccine, typically. It's, we're, not, we're not talking about something that you experience later in life. Um, but we usually remove uh, vaccines from service when they have those types of uh, noted side effects. And this is a perfect example of that. So we tend to be more overcautious uh is is the is that actually reasonable in this particular case based on the number of cases of blood clots there is no strict agreement in the scientific community over that so some countries believe that that number is high enough that it does warrant restriction of use of the vaccine and some don't so um it, it's not as clear-cut as you might think anyway Bri, I'm going to look into this. I'm going to come back. Anyway, if you're interested in more information about vaccines, my other class um, said, hey, how come they don't publish what's in vaccines? That seems really shady to me. Uh, of course, that's not true. They do publish exactly what's in every vaccine. Um, and for example, I have posted here on, the, on this page um, what's in the Pfizer vaccine. It's on page two of the document released by the CDC. Same thing is true for the Moderna one. Those are the mRNA vaccines. Um, and then the other vaccines, which are traditional vaccines, also have their ingredients posted. Again, there's, there's, nothing, um, there's nothing secret about what is contained within them. And in fact, you can't make them secret because you have to be able to evaluate uh, allergic responses to the ingredients of a vaccine. So, um, so just to be clear, um, there is no secret surrounding what is in a vaccine. Uh, also, people said, well, how come, how come the process for making it is secret then? Also not true. <laughs> so the process for making all vaccines, including mRNA vaccines, is public domain knowledge. Uh, if you have your own lab and you want to make an mRNA vaccine, uh, I've cited a really interesting paper here, an academic paper on the process for making an mRNA vaccine. It is uh, public domain information. I'm not saying it's an easy process. It most certainly is not. Uh, but how they are made is public domain. You can, you can look and see how they are made. 
Um, so just to dispel any uh, potential rumors here about vaccines, there seems to be a ton of them floating around right now, but it, this is all public information. Now the process, the specific process, for example, to make the Pfizer vaccine or the, or the um, Moderna vaccine is proprietary. In other words, the specific amounts of each ingredient and how they are creating it in terms of specific recipe is proprietary. They, they, don't, they don't share that knowledge. And they also restrict other companies from using that knowledge to make an exact copy of it to protect their intellectual property rights. Um, but the ingredients are not secret and the process is not secret. Um, so... And obviously the reason behind that is so that they can make more money <laughs> from the vaccine. They don't want people just copying the vaccine and selling it for cheaper um, or selling it for the same price, kind of stealing their intellectual property. That being said, many governments, especially because this is an emergency situation, don't like the idea that, um, I'll use Pfizer as an, as an example, is trying to protect their intellectual property with regards to the vaccine. And so many governments are mulling the idea of removing intellectual property rights for these specific vaccines. Uh, there was a newspaper article yesterday uh, that I read in the Post about Canada discussing potentially removing intellectual property rights on COVID vaccines, uh, essentially opening it up so that anybody could potentially use that process to make an exact copy of the vaccine that already exists. So um, I have a feeling that that will happen. Um, I don't think that the government probably is gonna play around with this idea of protecting uh, business intellectual property over health and safety of Canadians. Although, I mean, there's no guarantee there. They, they, they have a tendency to protect business interests as well because they wanna motivate businesses to make these vaccines. So it, there's a little bit of a, a balance that you have to play there. But anyway, the US has already been discussing removing intellectual property rights from vaccines. That's, that's all I'm going to say about this for now. <laughs> Sorry, I kind of went on a little side trip there. I will investigate um, the AstraZeneca vaccine. I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to come back with that info, but I'm going to talk a little bit more generally about viruses first. So um, interesting start to our discussion. What makes something alive? And this, this is related to the idea of this entire unit, which is biodiversity, diversity of living things. And you probably have talked about this in grade 10 or, or in grade 8. In grade 8, you also talk about what makes something alive. And there is sort of like a general list that we have uh, in terms of classifying things as being living. And that is that they must respond to stimuli. Uh, that is, when something happens to a particular organism, are they able to do something about that? Can they move towards light or away from light? Can they move towards a food source or away from a food source? Can they change their behavior in response to something that is happening in their environment? And it doesn't have to be very complicated. Um, for example, a sea sponge uh, may notice an increase in temperature and therefore it may filter more food particles due to an increase in temperature or whatever. There doesn't have to be significant movement or anything of the organism. Um, plants release various uh, chemical messengers when they're... Um, exposed to various different types of stimuli. All living things do this, even single-celled organisms. So can they do that? Do they have some type of metabolism? Do they use fuel uh, and in the process produce waste? Okay, I have produced waste separately on there, but it's really part of the same system. Um, are they able to adapt to their environment and change based on their environmental conditions? Virtually all, I mean, should say virtually all organisms do that to some extent. Do they have a system of reproduction? Do some way to replicate themselves? Do they grow during their life cycle? All living things do that. Okay, so this is our general list. And, you know, if you look through all the kingdoms at every single member of every single species, they all do these things to some extent. When we look at viruses, you have to, you can go through this list and say, okay, well, does a virus respond to stimuli? Nope, not at all. Do they eat? No. Do they adapt in any way to their external environment? No. Do they reproduce on their own? No. Do they produce waste products? Nope. 
Do they grow in any way? No. So viruses don't do any of the behaviors that we ascribe to living things. And so these ones are a little bit tough to classify. Because they don't directly reproduce at all, we don't even have a way to classify them taxonomically. Because how do you know when one virus is a different species from a different virus? Not through any of the traditional methods that we would have used. So certainly you can't use the biological species concept. Now you could use the morphological species concept. And that's the idea of looking at differences in their physical characteristics, including their DNA, to establish differences between viruses. And that is, in fact, what we do. So there is a system of taxonomy that we use for viruses, and we name viruses based on a taxonomic system. Um, but it is very different from the taxonomical system of uh, all other organisms. So, for example, you can create a phylogenetic tree of living things, right? We, we did that. I'm, I don't know if I should scroll back here. I'll scroll back real quick. We can go through and make a phylogenetic tree. Did I go back too far? Of course I did. Um, here we go. We can make a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram for living things. We cannot do this for viruses because we essentially don't know how these splits happen, when these splits happen, especially if you go any length of time into the past because there's no fossil record for viruses. There's no way to sample viral DNA from a million years ago. Um, so we, we just have n none of this data for viruses. I can't even tell you how old viruses are. When did the first virus exist? That is completely unknown. We do not know the answer to that. Um, it's likely that viruses existed probably as long as living things have been around on Earth. And, and the reason we think that is because viruses have a tendency to cause mutations in other organisms. And because they cause mutations they actually increase the rate at which evolution occurs. And based on the rate of evolution that has been observed historically, there is an excellent chance that that rate has been modified by something unknown, probably viruses. However, we have no direct evidence of viruses historically at all. So when did they first exist in the history of life on Earth? It's a guess. We, we don't know when they first appeared. Uh, which is, I think that's cool. We, so we really don't know that much about viruses. Um, they're, in terms of their history, anyway. So we say that they're non-living. Some, some, if you're a virologist, you, you, might, you might call them pseudo-living because they, they do display some of these properties of a living thing, but they do it inside of another organism. Another organism is doing the things for them. Okay? So... Really, all that a virus is, is a piece of genetic material. So they're either DNA or RNA. Yeah, we'll talk about more between the differences of those in the genetics unit. You don't really need to know that at this point. But you should know that the genetic material that is in all living things, all actual living things, is DNA. Okay, Your genetic information is DNA. Bacteria's genetic information is DNA. Protists' genetic information is DNA. That goes. That's across the board, every living thing. Okay, so some viruses have that inside of them. Some of them have a modified version of DNA called RNA. We also have that, but we don't use it to store genetic information. So those are called retroviruses. So uh, viruses have that piece of genetic information, and then they're surrounded by a capsule on the outside, which is made of proteins. Sometimes there is an additional... Um, Sorry, that's called a capsid. Sometimes there is an additional layer around the virus, um, a package 
that allows the virus to more easily get in in and out of cells. And we'll talk about that in a second when we get into the anatomy of a virus. Um, but, but not all viruses have that. There's no cytoplasm inside. So it is, sometimes they have little packets of enzymes, but there, there's no goo inside the virus. It's basically just DNA and sometimes a few enzymes. And they are teeny tiny. If you remember back to when we talked about bacteria, they are one tenth to one one hundredth the size of a bacteria. And bacteria are already very small. So they're one one thousandth or one one hundredth, one one ten thousandth of the size of, of, a, of a cell, like a human cell. Um, so in, in other words, you can fit thousands of virus particles inside of a cell easily. I already mentioned this, but they don't really do anything on their own. They don't produce or use energy. They don't make any waste products. Really what they are is a floating instruction booklet. That's, that's the basics of what they are. They are a floating instruction booklet. And the instruction booklet are, is the instructions to make a copy of them. So if, you get, if they can get their instruction booklet inside an organism, because organisms just read DNA and build the thing, that's what pretty much all organisms do. You do that too. Your cells just read your DNA and build whatever the DNA tells them to build. They will read the DNA of the virus and just build copies of it. And then if those copies can get inside more cells, then those cells will build copies of it, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that, that's the basics of it. It's basically just like a floating instruction book for making copies of itself. Who, who would think that something like that could be so dangerous? <laughs> it sounds so innocuous, just like a floating instruction book. Um, but it, they're obviously very problematic uh, as indicated by the fact that none of us are at school right now. So. Um, yeah, we don't generally consider them to be living, although they're in like some kind of weird pseudo gray area. Some virologists consider them to be living. They are specific to a single host species, usually, or a grouping of hosts. For example, rabies can infect mammals, but only mammals. So the rabies virus does not infect anything outside of mammals. You don't get fish with rabies or, uh, you know, lizards or anything, uh, reptiles with rabies. Only mammals. Um, or you will get a virus that is specific to only one specific species, like HIV. So human HIV uh, only infects humans. There are versions of HIV that affect other species. For example, there's a feline version of it, um, which is actually relatively common. And there is a, a, an, a primate version of it that infects chimpanzees uh, and gorillas, I believe. But it is a different version of the virus. They may have all had a common origin. So there, there's, there's a lot of... Um, I shouldn't say there's a lot. There, There is a body of evidence that is suggestive that human HIV came from probably chimps. Uh, and the, the crossover likely came from the consumption of chimp meat. Basically, people that were eating wild bush meat of chimp. Uh, and then in that way, um, the, that was the original jump of the virus from one species to another. But there has to be a mutation in that virus that allows it to infect humans. So just by chance, the right mutation was there and the right contact occurred with the right human, uh, which allowed it to jump species, which does happen. That's how we get new viruses. And anyway, more info in the video about that. But typically they infect a small group of, of species. There are also, by the way, um, viruses that infect bacteria. I already mentioned this. They're called bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are really cool uh, because they may be an excellent alternative to antibiotics. We may be able to use viruses to kill bacteria in humans, uh, which would be really cool if we, we, we could figure out how to do that. There's quite a bit of research going on into adapting bacteriophages to use them as antibiotics. Um, bacteria do not become immune to bacteriophages in the same way that they become immune to antibiotics. So it may be a way to sort of short circuit that process and remove um, the uh, immunity 
that bacteria experience. OK, so the reason we don't think they're alive, we already mentioned this, they don't do any of the things. Where do they come from originally? We don't know, but we have a hypothesis that is supported by some evidence uh, that they originated as small parasitic cells that were taken into a host cell at some point. This is during some point during the evolution of life, probably early. Uh, and then once they were taken in, they lost their cell membrane and were able to replicate only within the cell. And so those particles were somehow, somehow, again, there's a lot of somehows here, um, escaped from the original cell where they were, in, they were inhabiting and were taken up by sisters of that cell and possibly evolved from there. Okay, they, they, took, they carried on the same processes in the new cell that they were taken up by. Um, yeah, there's a lot of maybes and something there's not you, there's not direct connecting the dots here so that's that's a suggested mechanism for for the origination of viruses but we don't we don't really know so um you are probably aware that viruses have a role in human illness <laughs> a significant role not all viruses cause illnesses in humans but unlike bacteria where i could name off a thousand useful properties that viruses have uh, I really can't do that as easily or with bacteria that bacteria have rather I can't do that as easily with viruses um, because we really only tend to even know about them if they're pathogens uh, there are lots of viruses probably that aren't pathogenic but we never really figure out what they are because we we don't know to look for them if they're not pathogenic and they're very small and difficult to detect so we basically just don't find them unless they're pathogens. So those are really the only ones that we care about as humans. Maybe bacteriophages to use as antibiotics. But other than that, uh, we, we don't tend to really care too much about viruses unless they're causing illness. Uh, lots of different illnesses are caused by viruses. Uh, I mentioned AIDS earlier, or I mentioned HIV, which causes AIDS, uh, cholera, rabies, lots, lots of stuff. COVID, obviously. Um, they are important in an ecological sense because they are population regulators in nature. So they, they do have a valuable role as pathogens in nature in preventing um, overpopulation of species. That, that's really what they do in an ecological sense. So it's not that they don't have an ecological role. They do. Um, but as humans, we, we tend not to care very much about that. Although they, they, it's not that they're unimportant ecologically. Um, we, we probably do need them for population reg regulation in, in an ecological sense, but, um, humans don't really care about our own. We, we don't support our own population restrictions. So, um, we tend to think of them as being exclusively negative, although that's probably not entirely accurate. So later on, I'm going to get you to do this on your own, but uh, I'm just going to get you to fill in what an epidemic is. Uh, typically, epidemic, the term is used in reference to viral outbreaks. What does it mean for something to be a pandemic? What is endemic? And what is the current state of our outbreak of COVID-19? Uh, this, this information will take you very little time to find. <laughs> there, I would say that there's so much information on COVID now that you'll be able to find this information very quickly. But um, just to relate it back to what's going on right now, um, what do these three terms mean? Epidemic, endemic, and pandemic. And what is the status of COVID currently? Okay, I'm gonna, I'll get you to fill that in after. I want to talk a little bit about the anatomy of viruses. I mentioned that um, viruses have a capsid so you can see that there's a whole bunch of different variety in terms of shapes of viruses. They usually have some kind of casing around the outside called a capsid. It's made of protein. Uh, and in the middle, they're going to have their genetic information. So that genetic information is either going to be DNA, which is a double-sided, double helix molecule, just like your DNA, or 
They are RNA, which is a single-sided molecule. But when the RNA gets taken up by a cell, it usually gets incorporated into the DNA of the organism. And we're not going to talk about that process because it's pretty complicated. But, um, but either way, the RNA becomes DNA. So there's a little piece of DNA. And that DNA is the instructions for making a copy of the virus. There is a capsid on the outside. And sometimes, depending on the type of virus, there is also an envelope. So what the envelope is, is a, it's very similar to a cell membrane that is just surrounding the capsid. And it's a disguise. I think that's the best way to describe it. Um, it is often made out of the same type of membrane and the same pro has the same proteins as the organism that created it. So if this is a human virus, and this is an example of a coronavirus, by the way, um, uh, you can see the, the proteins sticking off of the side, forming a circle. Uh, remember, this is 3D, so it's actually um, a three-dimensional sphere here. But under the microscope, you see it in two dimensions. And so these proteins that are around the outside that like form this circle are, um, that's called the corona of the virus. Uh, it's a circle. So that's, what, that's why it's called, it's called the coronavirus. Um, the proteins and stuff that are sticking off of that circle are similar to the same ones that you would see on the outside of the cells of that organism. So, so when this virus is making its way around inside the target or inside the host, um, it's going to just blend in basically when, when the immune system initially sees these shapes and this virus, they'll say, Oh, okay, that looks right. This is, I think this is a thing that should be here, you know, <laughs> free pass. So it makes it a little bit easier for the virus to infiltrate. It's a disguise. Uh, and when it encounters a cell membrane of the target of the host, um, it can actually become part of the cell membrane. So I have a little diagram on the side here. Kind of works like this, where you've got this virus with an envelope. It touches the cell membrane and then delivers the virus capsid into the inside of the cell. And the same thing works in reverse. If the virus particles are being uh, created inside the cell, they can move to the outside of the cell, cover them in the membrane of the cell, and then they become enveloped. So they have an envelope on the outside, which allows them to penetrate into other cells that have not yet been infected. It's a disguise, basically. It's, it's wearing the skin of your target on the outside. A little bit creepy. Um, any questions about that before we move on? the basic structures here. There's really not that much to it. DNA or RNA in the middle, which are the instructions for reproducing it. Uh, there's often a capsid. There's usually a capsid around the DNA. And then around that, there's typically an envelope, although not all viruses have an envelope. If I see any questions, I'll circle back. So I just I just have this basically summarized at the bottom right here. This is this is the exact information that I just mentioned. They vary in structure. They all have DNA or RNA surrounded by an envelope. Uh, that actually should say surrounded by a capsid. Not all of them are, have an envelope. Oops. Always finding stuff in my notes. Sometimes an envelope. The envelope is often created when the virus leaves the host cell. So I want to talk a little bit now about the basic, the basics of how the immune system functions, and how a vaccine works. As I mentioned, we were going to get to vaccines, and I am still absolutely going to investigate this AstraZeneca vaccine. In fact, if I had, I can look it up on my phone in the background while you guys are writing.
I mean, I could just ask my wife. But my wife would be happy to tell you. Maybe I should just get her down here. Okay, here, let me give you more detail here. There you go. I've done my research now. <laughs> all right. So, first of all, it's important to note that the reason that the AstraZeneca vaccine has been paused for people under the age of 55 is because we are investigating further the claims that there is a significant increase in blood clotting episodes for people on the AstraZeneca vaccine. The reason we haven't paused it for people above the age 55 is because the risks associated with getting COVID are much higher than are the risks of the vaccine. So there is a give and take there, but essentially you are far better off in terms of your risk profile in getting the AstraZeneca vaccine than you are in not getting it because your risk of COVID and COVID related complications is so high in comparison to the potential risk of getting the AstraZeneca vaccine that it, it does not make sense to restrict use of the vaccine based on a one in 250,000 potential chance of experiencing blood clotting. Okay, so that's that's the that's the important thing to note, the reasoning why it has not been paused for people over the age of 55 because their risk profile is so much more significant for COVID. Okay? So that that that's to start something to consider. The the second thing to think about here is that the reason why it's paused for people under the age of 55 is that there is some evidence that there is an increase in related blood clotting from the vaccine. However, that needs to be further investigated. In other words, the amount of evidence and the amount of risk that has been demonstrated in other jurisdictions is relatively low. I mean, it is extremely low. We're talking about one in... Let me look this up here. Yeah, so, so the European um, data that's come in already has shown rates of 6 in 6.8 million uh, doses of the vaccine distributed. Six cases in 6.8 million is rough, it's, it's roughly one in a million, right? That exists. Uh, however, the background rate of people experiencing blood clots um, is moderate. It, uh, people get blood clots. And so they, we haven't done a great job of nailing down the exact causes of the blood clots in this particular case. Now, they've been attributed to, to the vaccine. Th those six cases have been attributed to the vaccine, probably due, due to the when they've occurred relative to when the vaccine has been given. So there's a good chance that the vaccine has caused those six in six million um, blood clots. However, again, keep in mind the risk associated with that for the Canadian population were we to transmit those results to our population. We would potentially be talking about side effects occurring for 25 or 30 people in Canada. Okay, I'm not saying that that risk is non-existent, and there are always risks associated with these things. Um, I mean, you could you could get in uh, in a car accident tomorrow and die, and there's a significant risk of that happening. Um, but it's a far lower risk than there is of getting a blood clot from the AstraZeneca vaccine. So, um, th those are some things that we need to keep in mind. It's not no risk though, so I'm not I'm not trying to downplay it and suggest that there are no risks associated with being vaccinated at all. That's not that's disingenuous to say that because that's not true. However, um, if a country is making large scale healthcare decisions, you you can't necessarily discourage people, um, or or it's not even wise to discourage people from getting a vaccine based on what is essentially an infinitesimally small risk. Um, especially when people are dying. Um, your risk of dying from COVID is way, way higher than that. I mean, as a comparative. 
And so, yes, there's a, there is currently a pause on delivering that vaccine to people under 55. It may resume based on um, research that is done on the effects that have been found so far, but it may not. Maybe it's better to use a different vaccine um, for people of all ages. And it's quite possible that people that have already received the first dose will likely get their second dose of a different vaccine. That may be the, what the end decision is made regarding the vaccine. And part of that, by the way, is PR. Um, because if if there is a risk like that that is present, the government always wants to make sure that people feel comfortable getting the vaccine because that's a big part of getting a large percentage of the pop- population vaccinated. So if there's something out like like that out there in the public domain that people are that are people are scared of that's counterproductive to the goal of vaccinating a large percentage of the population. Hi, what are your thoughts on the AstraZeneca vaccine and the blood clotting risk? Or do you have a second? Um, so this is a long conversation. Okay, all right, all right I'll, I'll talk to you about it later. Okay. Anyway, um, that. That is the current information that's out there in terms of, um, well, at least what's coming from Health Canada. Um, so I, I, it's it's a wait and see. If you if you got the AstraZeneca vaccine at any age, de- there is definitely not enough risk present there for you to be concerned. You should not be concerned. However, um, that's not to say that it doesn't warrant further investigation, which is exactly what is happening. So. Okay, I'm going to move on here. Um, but I do un- I do understand why people are concerned. People people want there to be zero risk associated with being vaccinated, which, of course, I understand. I would prefer there, there to be zero risk as well. So, um, and if, if obviously if that, we can establish that with a different vaccine, then we should do that. But, th- like, there's a reason for the pause. So, anyway, I'm going to stop talking about this. You can look up this data yourself if you want. Uh, Health Canada's released numbers on this. Uh, and as and there's um, I, I can if you want I can, I can post an article or something that discusses this in a little bit more detail. But um, essentially, it requires further study. Um, how does a vaccine work? Things inside of your body are covered in shapes. That's the, I think that's the best way to put it. Um, the surfaces of your cells have shapes on them. And those there's all different shapes. And those shapes are mostly proteins on the surfaces of your cells, on your cell membranes. They're transmembrane proteins, and there's, there's a whole bunch of different ones. Um, and some of those shapes are common to all humans. They all have those same shapes. And some of those shapes are specific to you. The ones that are specific to you are called your MHC, your major major histocompatibility complex. It's essentially like a personalized system of flags that says, this is me. This is my cells. Uh, And your immune system is trained to see your shapes, your major histocompatibility complex, and essentially recognize that those cells are safe. And this is the reason, by the way, that when you get a transplant of a heart or something from another human, uh, they have different MHC proteins. So your immune system will attack and destroy um, those organs that have been given to you from somebody else. You have to take drugs to essentially hold your immune system off and prevent it from destroying the tissue that's been transplanted into you. if they are a close match, that is their MHC looks similar to your MHC, it's, it means that you, your immune system won't attack it as much. So it usually lasts quite a bit longer, which is why you need a compatible person for an organ transplant. You need someone with a close MHC to your MHC. Uh, if you get it from an identical twin, you have identical MHCs. Congratulations. So you can actually just give organs to your identical twin and it's not problematic. That's kind of fun. Um, but other than that, uh, there's always going to be some kind of rejection complications involved in getting an organ transplant. So if you can imagine, you've got these little shapes on the surface of your cells. Other organisms have their own shapes. So a virus and a virus capsid or a virus envelope 
is going to have their own system of shapes on the outside. And when you get sick with anything, bacteria, virus, uh, protist infection, uh, fungi, fungal infection, anything, uh, your body learns the shapes that were on that thing. Okay, you have white blood cells and your white blood cells. There's a whole host of different kinds, but they work together to produce flags that fit onto those shapes, those specific shapes. So for example, let's say you got the flu last year and there's specific shapes on that flu. You probably didn't get the flu twice because your body learned to build flags for the shapes that fit on that flu. Those flags are called anti an antibodies, by the way. Uh, and the shapes are called antigens. I don't know if I mentioned that. Antigens are the names of the shapes. So you learn how to build flags for those shapes. And then when, when that thing shows up again, you have a ton of those shapes already floating around, or a ton of those flags floating around in your blood. And you have cells capable of building more flags very quickly. So you can very quickly flag them, eat them, remove them, and sometimes often the flags actually inactivate them as well. They prevent them from doing any damage. So you usually only get those infections once, okay, because you have the flags. What a vaccine does is gives you the shapes, usually not the actual um, infection itself, although that is one way. You could take the virus or bacteria uh, and you could just mash it up, so bust them apart and give people that busted apart version. That's one way of making a vaccine. It does not work super well. Uh, you could also breed a version of the virus or bacteria that is that causes a very minor illness, uh, but still offers protection to the more severe form. Again, there's all, there's complications with all these different methods for making vaccines. Um, but the newest way, which I think is the coolest way, is the mRNA vaccine. So th th this is uh, what has been largely lauded um, as th this is the new type of vaccine. And, and it's not just, by the way, for the COVID vaccine. mRNA vaccines have been around for 15 or more years. But there's just never been a large-scale use of an mRNA vaccine up until now. Uh, which is why uh, people say, oh, well, they're new. Oh, well, they're, they're not really new. They, they've been around for a long time, and there's been a lot of testing with other types of mRNA vaccines, just not on a global scale. So, um, and, and so this is, the, this is the Pfizer vaccine. I believe the Moderna vaccine is also an mRNA vaccine. So they, how, they, how you do that is what you do is you get a piece of the viral DNA, and you read it. So you go through... And you go along and read all the different, it's like, okay, well, this is like A, T, G, C, G. You read the code. And then you figure out what that code builds. What are the shapes that that code is going to build? Okay, the shapes are proteins. So you can build those shapes in the lab. And what they actually do is, is viruses are built out of a whole bunch of different shapes, but you try and pick shapes that you think that the immune system will really see very well, that will interact very well from your virus. So you go through and there may, maybe it builds 50 shapes and you pick 12. You pick 12 shapes where you're like, oh yeah, the immune system will probably really be able to recognize these shapes. Then you build the shapes in the lab, okay, just the shapes, no viruses, nothing else, just the shapes. Okay, so that would be like these things. You build the proteins. Oopsie daisy. Come on. You just build the shapes. And then you inject somebody with just the shapes. That's fun. So their white blood cells go around and say, oh, incoming, we got shapes. These shapes do not look like they belong here. And so your body will learn to build flags for those shapes. I like to call them bad guy flags. Those are the antibodies. So you've never had this viral infection before in your life, uh, but all of a sudden your immune system has been trained to identify what the shapes, the antigens look like for that particular virus or, or bacteria. This works for bacteria as well. Um, and then if you ever do come into contact with the virus, you already build the flags. So hopefully, and this doesn't always work, but it often works, um, you're, you're able to quickly muster up a bunch of flags 
flag them down and prevent those virus particles from becoming active in your body. You're essentially, it's like an early, a vaccine is an early warning system. It's a wanted poster. Look out for this guy. <laughs> if you see this guy, it's a bad guy. Because normally this response, learning how to build antibodies, um, getting a bunch of white blood cells together that can build these antibodies, uh, it takes about two weeks. There's a turnaround time. Uh, and so if you get the vaccine in about two weeks, you have some level of protection, which is really cool. So vaccines are pretty much the gem, uh, the feather in the hat of all of biology. <laughs> they, are, they are the greatest accomplishment of biology as a study. Uh, and I say that completely unreservedly because the development of vaccines is what has allowed humans to populate the earth uh, in the way that they have. We have completely changed the way humans can exist on the earth because of vaccines. If you lived a hundred years ago, where you could have gotten polio or uh, smallpox or, or you name it, okay, um, that sucks. <laughs> Those illnesses were the blight of human existence. I, I, gotta, I should show you what smallpox looks like. It is a terrible, painful, and often fatal disease. Oof, that looks terrible. Um, measles, mumps. Mumps causes sterility in males. Um, oh, I could go on and on for all of the things that we have vaccines for, which is a lot, by the way. Um, we don't have polio, which can be crippling. You know, it can, it can, it can cripple you for life. Um, th these are horrible illnesses. Uh, and, and we have been able to essentially eliminate a huge proportion of these illnesses. I mean, completely wipe them out. Smallpox doesn't even exist anymore because of vaccination. Um... It's it's really amazing. It, it is it is the great victory of science uh, that we were able to develop vaccines in the way that we have. That's a rumor. So you can't get COVID from the vaccine. I, I can say that completely unreservedly. You cannot get it from the vaccine. Now, one of the problems with getting vaccinated is that you have to go somewhere where there's people when you get vaccinated. That's unavoidable. And, and and we try and distance and uh, I mean, I've had my vaccine. You don't get it anywhere close to people, but that's not to say that you have no human contact. And so, yes, is it possible for you to go to a vaccination center and get COVID from somebody at the vaccination center who has COVID? Yes. And does that happen? 100%. Yes, that does happen sometimes. So I'm fairly certain what people are mixing up here is the fact that they got COVID at the vaccine center, which you can do. That can happen. You're not immune to COVID the moment the vaccine goes into your arm. Uh, after the first vaccine, you have about 80% protection, give or take a few percent, depending on the type of vaccine that you're getting. Um, and that takes two weeks for you to establish that level of protection. It does not happen instantly. So if you're, if you're exposed to COVID at the vaccine center, you just get it. It doesn't, it doesn't change your ability to get COVID. So I, I have a feeling that that's the confusion that's happening. And absolutely, people have gotten infected at, at a vaccine center. That's real. So um, so I'm not going to pretend that doesn't happen. That does happen. Now, it's, it's still obviously worthwhile for you to get vaccinated, but it is possible for that to occur. It, it is not possible for you to get it from the vaccine. The vaccine contains zero virus. There is no virus in the vaccine whatsoever. No DNA, no RNA. It's impossible for you to get it from the vaccine itself um, because it's shapes. Now, there are other types of vaccines that produce their shapes in a different way. Uh, often, uh, they take actual samples of the virus and break it down. I mean, but these, again, you can't get, you still can't get COVID from, from those types of vaccines. It, it's literally, there's no recorded case of it ever happening, ever. So, so, so no, you can't get it that way anyway. But there are other ways to produce these vaccines. But this way of producing them, taking the DNA... Um, and using that to actually build the shapes based on what we think will be a good profile of shapes for protection is a triumph. It is amazing. mRNA vaccines are, again, another triumph of science. Um, 
they're fantastic. And they allow us to build vaccines for things very quickly and often for things that we would otherwise not be able to make vaccines for. So and anyway, it's, it's just sort of a new frontier in vaccines over the last 20 years. Uh, and it's been ex- extremely, um, it's worked extremely well for COVID, uh, which is uh, well, part, partially why we're talking about this. But anyway, that, that, that in general is how a vaccine works. I'm not, I'm not going to go into too much more detail, but, but they are absolutely amazing. Uh, once they become approved for young people, which they almost certainly will, there's a lot of testing going on right now, but you guys will be able to get the vaccine shortly. I'm quite certain. Obviously, there's no public data about that yet, but, uh, but there's no reason why you wouldn't, um, based on the preliminary data for protection that it offers to young people and, this, and the side effects profile, which again is relatively minor. Um, I, I'm sure that you will be offered it at some point. Uh, you should get vaccinated. I can say that unreservedly. Even if you experience a um, uh, allergic reaction, which does happen, uh, I don't know what the rate of uh, allergic reaction is. I, it, it's in the hundred, one in a hundred thousands, I believe. Uh, but they do happen. There are allergic reactions that certainly do happen from vaccination. You can be allergic to the components of a vaccine. Um, you stay at the vaccine center after you're vaccinated and they're trained there to treat your allergic reaction. So they're going to give you epinephrine. Uh, I don't know of any recorded deaths from an allergic reaction since we, since generally we're, people are prepared for those to happen at the vaccine center. So, uh, but you do have to be careful. I mean, that again, those things exist, but, um, they're treatable. Uh, and you should get vaccinated. (laughs) <laughs> okay, again, I can say that unreservedly when, when you're able to. Um, so I just mentioned below here that vaccines sometimes contain a weakened form of the virus. Uh, that's the old way. Uh, and we still do that all the time. So you may be wondering then, how come sometimes we can't make a vaccine? Why is there no herpes vaccine? Why is there no HIV vaccine? Great question. Uh, well, how come I need to get the flu vaccine every year? Well, the problem is that many viruses mutate very, very quickly. So much so that if you get HIV, if you look at the virus in the same person over a length of time, over years, it actually has different antigens, different shapes in the same person over time. So... And a lot of viruses are like that. They mutate very quickly. And so creating a vaccine that has a certain profile of shapes is so hard to do. Is that right? It's clear for 12 plus. Well, that's cool. That's cool. Um, I have heard that there are, I've heard of 16 plus. I've heard of people that are 16 getting it. I didn't realize it was 12 plus. That's that's great. Right, I'm glad here that it's been approved. Um, Anyway, I'm sure it'll be offered to you guys shortly, but um, what, was I, what was I talking about here? I uh, lost my train of thought. Right, quick mutation. So, so far, we haven't been able to figure out which shapes are always common um, in a domain for HIV, for example. So we haven't been able to develop an effective HIV vaccine. doesn't exist. One day, it's possible that it, we may figure out how to do it, but currently haven't been able to do it. Same thing is true for things like um, a, a herpes simplex virus or um, the flu. So the flu is interesting. It doesn't mutate that quickly, and we're usually able to come up with a vaccine that will work for a year. We have to predict which strains of flu will be popular in a given year, then we make our vaccine and hope that we're right about which ones we guess will be popular strains, uh, in which case it will offer you good protection. If we're wrong, then the vaccine in that particular year does not offer good protection against the flu. Uh, and then we do the whole thing again the next year. So we make some guesses with the flu vaccine, and that's why you have to be vaccinated every year. There is a possibility that COVID will work the same way, that we may have to have repeated vaccinations or a booster shot of some kind Um, in order to have continued protection for a long period of time. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. We don't really know very much about the long-term effectiveness of these vaccines. So it is possible that it will require uh, a little change up from time to time. Uh, 
So th that is quite possible. I, d I don't know what the current evidence is in terms of the long-term effectiveness, but I, I think a year out, most of the vaccines seem to be still effective a year out. So who knows? Maybe, maybe we won't require that. But um, but there is a possibility that that might be that might happen. Uh, ooh, as another interesting aside, the flu vaccine, we have to make a prediction about next year's flu. That is the flu that is going to happen next winter, right? That would be the that would be flu season. But because everybody is wearing masks, we have drastically reduced the number of people that got the flu this year. I mean, it is to unprecedentedly low levels, the flu. Uh, imagine that. Everybody's washing their hands and wearing masks. So people are not spreading the flu around nearly as much as normal. So uh, this is very interesting. We're not exactly sure which strains to pick for the flu vaccine for next year. I have no idea how that problem is going to be solved, actually. I don't know if there will be a flu vaccine next year. Um, because we, we don't know what strains are popular now. Uh, so it's very, very difficult to predict what to put in the flu vaccine for next year. So I, I'm, I'm not sure how that problem will be solved. I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to follow that. Um, but I'm not sure what's going on with that. That's that's an interesting problem. Okay, last part of this for viruses. We're definitely, by the way, going to skip the protist stuff. We'll never get to that today. We're way outside of that time. Um, but I'm going to get you to read about Ontario's routine immunization schedule. Those are the vaccines that you probably have already received. And below here, I'd like you to just to list what have you been vaccinated against? Which diseases have already been eliminated for you? It's interesting to think about because you don't think about this. At least I don't. I don't think about what I'm already immune to because I've been vaccinated, but it's a bunch. I've already received a whole bunch of vaccines. Um, and so I didn't have to worry about infantile per pertussis and uh, measles and mumps and rubella and tetanus and I, it's a list. It's a list. I'd like you to take a look at the list and just see what, what do we have vaccinations available for and what have you probably already received? Uh, because that's good information for you to know. Okay, so what are you working on? That's one of the questions. I'm going to stop talking now because I've been talking for a long time. Uh, two great videos. They're both fairly short, around five minutes. Um, really excellent videos, though. Uh, if you're interested in the autism vaccine controversy, great article that talks about the history of that. Uh, if you are interested in any of the details surrounding the ingredients that are found in vaccines, I posted that. The other class asked about that, which is why it's posted. And there is an article, an academic paper here as well, linked uh, about how to create an mRNA vaccine. Um, it is written as an academic paper, though, so I will say that the language in it is a little bit um, challenging. So, um, but if you're curious, uh, this second part here on protists, we're actually going to do tomorrow morning. So I'm going to say, just don't go past that part. Okay. So you've got the, whatever the remaining questions that you have from bacteria and archaea, and there are some videos and, uh, a question from the notes for you to complete on viruses. There's actually two questions in the notes. If you guys have any questions at all, Please let me know. I will be here the entire time. But I'm going to let you get to work. Sorry for being so long-winded. <laughs>